Okay, we're live on the YouTube channel now. Recording in progress. Consent. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Uh, it's 1.07, we'll start in two or three minutes. Uh, we still have a couple of people dropping in. So I just wanna make sure that we, uh, we have as many people as we can at the start of the session. And since I'll do, I'll do a five minute intro, Stephanie. Um, so if I see more people uh, materializing, I'll be able to get them in uh, before your talk starts uh, fully. Yeah, I suppose uh, you're not in Miami right now, but you've been looking at what happened with that um, building collapse. It seems like it was really, really something that everybody could have done something about. Yeah, it's uh, horrific and tragic and terrible. We were we were there when it happened um, last week. Oh my and God. It's, yeah. it's all anybody, I mean, not at the building, obviously, but we, yeah. we lived a few minutes uh, walking south from there. So we were by that building all the time. And it's a very... Um, <sighs> Very beautiful neighborhood in uh, it's the tip of Surfside on Manly Beach. Yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit in the talk actually today, um, because it's bringing up a lot of questions and the responses that are coming out around it. Uh, I think are are pertinent to what we'll be talking about today. Yeah, but it's it's awful. They 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 now have sixteen dead, one hundred and forty seven missing. It looks I like. know. I so know. yeah, the missing doesn't seem like it's optimistic from that front. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, let's, uh, perhaps we'll get started. I'll do my intro and then um, if anyone else is coming in, I'll let them in to the Zoom session. So good afternoon from New York here. I, I think some people are signing in from other places where it's either evening or morning. Uh, my name's Ed Keller. I'm the co-director with Carla Leitao of the Postplanetary Universal Design Program at the New Center. And I'm a creative director of this year's Space and Planetary Design Program with the Venice Architecture Biennale underneath the auspices of the Italian pavilion curated by Alessandro Mellis and the Italian virtual pavilion curated by Tom Kovac. Um, so many, many thanks to Alessandro and Tom for making this extended series of events, lectures, performances, uh, symposia, conferences possible from June to November of 2021. Uh, again, underneath the support of the Italian pavilion in the Biennale. And many thanks, especially to the brilliant designers and thinkers who are joining in this extended series of events across the year, which City X Venice and the Italian Pavilion have made possible. For my part, the Overview Effect Lecture Series is the first in a set of talks and events in the space and planetary design track that I have curated and convened this year. It's positioned as a survey of some of the key operational themes critical to what we could call post-planetary and universal design. And we bring together an architect, engineer, historian, Lydia Calipoliti, uh, an AI developer, mathematician, philosopher, Ben Gertzel, a science fiction author and marine biologist, Peter Watts, and a transdisciplinary geographer and ecologist, today's speaker, Stephanie Wakefield. Uh, and by bringing these four people from very diverse disciplinary backgrounds together, we engage the question of how boundaries could be effectively and critically reshaped towards a universal modality of design thinking. Um, so many, many thanks to the, the four speakers, also our special guests across the lecture series, the uh, New School Policy and Design for Outer Space Group, Fred Sharman, the architect and historian, and David Roden, the philosopher. Um, let me speak for just a, a couple of minutes about what the implications of post-planetary universal design might be. Uh, and I've said this in, in your other talks as well, but let me just um, run this introduction by everybody in case you haven't heard it. As architects, urbanists, infrastructural designers, system thinkers, economists, ecologists, AI designers, we navigate and negotiate with the intertwined webs of human energy expenditure and information flow and their impacts on civilization and all species on earth. Our challenge would be to envision new configurations at the edge of a planetary comfort zone. For example, architecture's conception of itself as a discipline has depended for centuries on a model of the artificial in relation to the natural and the primal human action in the wilderness. Do we build a hut or do we make a bonfire? 
This tension between codex of preservation or rituals of conflagration also configures the very base of organic and planetary life and the negative entropies of design. And I, as I said yesterday, I think we're also all on fire chemically in our bodies. Um, and so this question of do we preserve or do we burn is a, a crucial question for us as living beings on our, on our planet. So you could say design becomes a temporalized act, potentially a radically temporalized act. And design would function as an amplifier or an attenuator for the planetary broad spectrum codex of our historical, material, organic, and socio-technical configurations. We operate both in our lives and in our design, our built environments across a deep arc of temporalities from the moment of a gesture or the life of a single organism to the millennial long presence of a building, a law, a city, an ecosystem up to the billions of years of our planet. So, this is a, a series of questions about world making, unmaking, remaking, writ both small and large. The overview effect, as you all know, the overview effect is often used to describe the experience of cognitive shift that astronauts have when they're in orbit above the planet and they see the Earth from orbit for the first time. Famously, the first image is taken from the moon, looking back at the Earth, as Joni sang about in one of her songs, offer us a partial access to the cognitive shift in our ability to grasp scales of space and scales of time. And so we hope that by titling these four inaugural lectures underneath the, uh, the aegis of the overview effect, we can see how the disciplinary overlaps can produce that. Let me introduce our speaker today, Stephanie Wakefield. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining. You've spoken in a, a bunch of um, lecture classes and seminar classes when I was at the new school and it was always incredibly inspiring and um, catalyzing brilliant to hear you speak. So thanks so much for joining us today. Stephanie is a geographer whose work explores the political, technical, and philosophical transformations of urban life and infrastructure in the Anthropocene. She's currently director and assistant professor of the Human Ecology Program at Life University in Marietta, Georgia. She's the author of Anthropocene Backloop, Experimentation in Unsafe Operating Space. That's from Open Humanities Press. And she's co-editor of Resilience in the Anthropocene, Governance and Politics at the End of the World from Routledge. Her new book, The City in the Anthropocene, Resilience, Infrastructure, and Imagination at Miami's End, analyzes experimental sea rise adaptations and argues for Anthropocene critical urban theory. So i um, hand it over to you, Stephanie. Thank you again so much for joining. Sure. Thank you so much, Ed, uh, for having me. It's it's really a, a pleasure every time I get a chance to to talk with you and think with you. Um, and I and I have really loved all the different events you put together over the years that I've been a part of. I think this kind of um, cross disciplinary um, free thinking is, is so important right now. Um, so so what I thought I would do today is just share some thoughts with you all um, from some work that I've been doing recently. Um, from that book that, that Ed just mentioned, uh, The City and the Anthropocene, um, which is based on some research I have done over the last several years living in Miami Beach, uh, Florida, um, but which is also engaged with um, critical urban theory um, in, in the, the academic and, and art and planning world. Um, so let me go ahead and share some slides with you guys. <clears throat> Let's see here. I have just a very rudimentary slideshow here that we can look at. How does that look? That looks nice. You can see those okay? Yep, okay. looks good. Great, okay. Um, so yeah, so I, I would like to share some of the themes uh, and some of the questions that I've been coming to through this, this new project, um, because I think they might be relevant to this question of uh, the post-planetary or the planetary uh, as it's being asked right now and as it's being questioned right now in, in different ways, um, materially and in practice and in different sort of speculative imaginaries. Um, and in, in some sense, I, what you said just now, do we preserve or do we burn um, is sort of the, the big question really behind all of this. So it's, a, it's a great way of summing it up. And what do we mean? Um, is there only, only one meaning of preserving and is there only one meaning of, of burning? I think that would be the, the best way to, to summarize so sort of the stakes and the, the, the deeper questions um, here and what I'm going to talk about. So to, to start, I would like to, to, to just set this up with two sort of key um, thematics that I have been um, thinking about in this work. Um, two questions uh, that I've been coming to uh, and exploring in this research. So the first is this idea 
of the, the Anthropocene as an urban age. Um, so I have been questioning this idea, questioning this depiction of um, the Anthropocene as a, a inherently urban age, not only um, in terms of causes, but in terms of um, the unfolding 21st century. So here, what I'm interested in, in thinking critically about are um, the, the, the very, very hegemonic descriptions of the Anthropocene as an age of uh, planetary urbanization. And this, you know, we kind of have two main ways of understanding that, that, that we see there's the sort of, um, well, now we've crossed the threshold to where more than 50% of the world's population lives in cities. Thus, it is um, a primarily urban age, the majority of people living in, in urbanized uh, agglomerations, right? This is the sort of United Nations type definition that we see very often, uh, a numerical definition. Um, but we also see in, in um, urban studies and urban theory and urban thinking, the idea of planetary urbanization. Um, this idea that, you know, coming from the work of uh, urban theorist Neil Brenner and Christian Schmidt, uh, that the, 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 the planet is, is increasingly uh, covered in these, these socio-ecological networks of urbanized processes and technologies. So these two sort of definitions are out there. They're not the same. They're often in, you know, in conversation and critique with one another. Um, but but they, they tend to dominate the, the sense of what the Anthropocene will be. So we, we are used to a lot of um, discussions of the causes and the beginning origins of the Anthropocene originating with industrialization um, and urbanization in England and you know, the 1800s, late, late 1700s. And this is uh, even a Paul Crutzen uh, timeline for the beginning of the Anthropocene. But what I think is more, more interesting and, and, and uh, deserving of critical uh, you know, investigation is the, the, the idea that uh, the, the sort of inexorable development of urbanization and the Anthropocene are, are often portrayed as companion processes. So um, whatever unfolds it, it, with climate change and the 21st century, this will be an urban, urban fully urban planet, more, more and more fully urban planet. Um, so, so the question that this leads me to, to ask you know, just on the basis of the, the, the omnipresence and ubiquity of the, this discourse is, is planetary urbanization the necessary sort of telos and spatial limit of life in the Anthropocene? And, you know, we often hear a lot about the reason why that, that it will continue to be such an in, in, incredibly expansive urbanized uh, planet is because urban resilience is so possible and so, so dominant as a modality of responding to the Anthropocene. Um, but is, you know, this is another question that I think is important. Is urban resilience the sort of final form of urban responses to climate change um, and adaptation? Uh, will and should the urban as we know it actually survive the sort of upending impacts of climate change or human responses to it? Um, and I think these are uh, relevant questions for not only urban theorists, but maybe all of us uh, to consider um, in a pragmatic way, in a philosophical way, in a, in a, in a, in a normative way too. Um, okay, so that's the sort of first framing uh, set of questions and thematics. The, the second is, you know, related and in, in, in it pertains specifically to the, the work of uh, Neil Brenner, who I just mentioned, uh, originator of the, the idea of planetary urbanization as we, as we know it now. Um, and I, and I, I really love his work uh, a lot and it's, it's been um, really uh, generative for me in, in the way I think. Um, what, I, what I really appreciate most about his work is um, the sort of, this is sort of a foundational challenge that he, he puts to urban studies and urban thinkers, which is that he says, we as urban thinkers have for too long been, you know, assuming outmoded sort of 19th century spatial concepts to understand 21st century transformations, right? So this is his famous sort of challenge. He says that critical urban thinkers need to explode our inherited assumptions regarding the morphologies, territorializations, and socio-spatial dynamics of the urban condition. That's a quote of his. Um, and, and said, open our eyes to the mutations in, in urban form and process produced in the 21st century. So he calls for an urban theory for our time. And I think this is a very, you know, uh, you know very good um, critique, not just of urban studies, but of thinking in general, of practice in general, of politics in general, um, in the Anthropocene, right? So um, it, it, are we lugging around uh, outdated frameworks to understand or intervene in or challenge existing realities? I think this is a has always been one of the biggest questions of the Anthropocene. Can we actually, you know, do we need to come up with new frameworks and new modes of thought and new practices, strategies for a, a very, very different time, right? We're not living in the time of Marx and Engels. Um, so, so what does that mean? What does that mean for, for political strategy? What does that mean for planning, design, everything, right? Um, 
so but but one of the things that I, I note in 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 sort of reviewing all of the work uh, in planetary urbanization scholarship and, and thinking is that um, a, a lot less attention has been given uh, to how urban spatial forms and imaginaries and processes um, are being transformed by climate change and, and adaptive responses. So, and I think this is a, a really important thing to consider and to consider it in the spirit of Neil Brenner's challenge, right? Uh, um, to, to let go of our inherited assumptions, um, including the assumption that the Anthropocene will necessarily, without question, be an urban age. So um, what, what I've been trying to, to think about um, in this book and in some of this, this, this work that I've been doing is, um, you know, is that necessarily so? Is the Anthropocene necessarily an urban age? Will it, I mean, will it necessarily be an urban age? And, um, you know, is it, is it possible to come to a kind of critical Anthropocene um, urban theory that is open to transformations in spatial form and, and imagination that may push beyond even these very, very recently developed um, uh, analytical frameworks like this interconnected human, non-human planetary network. Right? So maybe maybe something else, many something else's are coming or maybe are already being imagined and 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 posing a sort of nascent uh, new possibility. Um, so that's that's these are the questions I've been asking. Um, uh, and they're more sort of food for thought rather than something that can be confirmed empirically on the ground. But I, I have been taking them up in, in the context of Miami and trying to see what is going on in Miami, Florida. Um, there we go. In Miami, Florida, um, in, a, in a city that is considered and problematized very explicitly as the front lines of sea rise in the United States. So you see here um, a beautiful over, overhead shot of of Miami and the, the greater Miami metropolitan area seen from the, the sky. This, this, it's this very, very densely urbanized strip um, along the Atlantic Southeastern coast of Florida. And what is, what is very beautiful also about this, this shot is you see how surrounded it is by water, by the ocean uh, on all sides. Um, it is a, a very beautiful, beautiful city, Miami. Um, and it is a, a place that has for you know, about a century, been uh, a place of real estate speculation, a place built on real estate speculation. Um, it is sort of a marvel of modern engineering in the sense that it was a, a, a great deal of the the Miami metropolitan area was built on reclaimed swampland, uh, wetlands, um, and fill, and um, and it's really you know for for about you know the, the last century been known as this sort of subtropical urban paradise for, for tourists, for um, vacationers from the Northeast of the United States or other parts of the world to come in the winter and sort of have this, 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 this place of you know, luxury, leisure and paradise, that, that sort of thing, um, <clears throat> as you see in that image. But more recently, one of the things that I have found very interesting is that the sort of image of Miami, the imaginary of Miami and the, the, the portrayal of Miami has really shifted um, in the last decade or so. This is a very, very recent uh, change in the, the thinking of Miami. Um, Miami is now considered the front lines of, of sea rise in the United States, like I said, because um, it is extremely low lying. It is built on porous limestone uh, as a foundation, which means that water comes, um, sea rise water, flooding water comes not only from the coast, you know, as it might in a city like New York City, um, but also up through the ground um, and up through drains and into streets and this sort of thing. And um, it, it, it's sort of a hot, a sea rise hotspot uh, in, in the world. And so it's, the seas are actually rising slightly faster uh, around the southeast, southeastern Florida area than in other parts of the world. And we are now uh, seeing actually uh, flooding from sea rise happening there um, during king tides and, and high tides and things like that. And I, I can I can say that I, I lived in Miami Beach for several years and, um, I did indeed have see a lot of flooding. Actually, um, it was you know on the at the intersections and in the streets, um, and it was gurgling up through drains and gurgling up through you know manhole things like that. Um, you know when cars drive through it, it's this kind of thing. Um, and you know so there's been a, there's been a real shift. A lot of media pieces, tons and tons of media pieces have come out um, saying you know Miami is doomed. You know Miami is the climate change ground zero. Um, you, you're seeing a lot of, you know, sensational images like this one here on the right. You can see of the octopus in the parking garage, 
um, which had been flooded. Uh, this is someone's Facebook post that kind of went viral on the internet. The other image here is um, some likely tourists walking through a flooded street in, in Miami Beach. Um, and so with, with the, the rise of these kinds of these sensational images and these, these media pieces, um, the, 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 the sort of characterization of Miami has changed. You still have a very concerted effort though to, to say that Miami is, um, it is, it's fine. It's financially viable. It is um, structurally viable. It is a place where it is safe to, to bring your investments to develop uh, big high-rise real estate projects. And it's you know very interestingly recently uh, in the last year during COVID there was a, a new kind of uh, Miami speculation. It seems like there's just cycles of these that keep coming and coming, and they're, they're they get they get sort of like crazier, more delirious every time. And, and this one has come from uh, efforts of. Miami Mayor uh, Suarez to say that Miami can be the next Silicon Valley and to try to attack, attract a lot of um, tech uh, companies to, to move there, um, people involved in cryptocurrency to make it the cryptocurrency capital of the United States and having conversations with Elon Musk and, and all this sort of thing. And there's been this sort of Twitter fervor over how, how amazing Miami is, you know, people, all these tech people coming and doing remote work and saying, ah, you know, there's, it's it's incredible. There's six hundred dollar apartments here, and this is this is not true. Actually, this, these people are buying like million dollar mansions on the waterfront and that kind of thing. Um, but it's a it's a really interesting beginning new speculative bubble in Miami, and we'll we'll see where it goes. But um, real estate has really skyrocketed uh, in Miami during COVID. Uh, the prices were already absolutely unlivable, un impossible before, um, and and they've gone up even more uh, in the last year as people we're remote working and flocking to the city and, and purchasing homes. Um, it's a, it, you know, it's a city of incredible inequality and that's important to, to, to mention just to understand if you've not been there, it's a place where you have some of the poorest zip codes in the, the country and the richest zip codes in the country, often adjacent to one another. Um, so, but in any case with this, with this new problematization of the city, uh, this new portrayal of the city as climate change ground zero, there has been a real effort on the part of the politicians and planners and designers to say um, that we can build resilience, that, that, that responses can be can be made uh, to preserve the city, and there, there will be Miami forever. This sort of idea. That's the, the idea. That's the name of this um, four hundred million dollar infrastructure bond that was passed recently to deal with, uh, amongst other things, sea rise and flooding. So, so this has been a place where the, the idea of urban resilience has become, um, uh, you know, again, very popular, just as it has in cities around the world in the last decade or so. Urban resilience, this idea that you can, you know, design new sort of adaptive infrastructures and a bricolage of sort of modular, soft infrastructure, hard infrastructure, nature as infrastructure, even people as infrastructure. That this idea that you can bring all these together, redefine essentially all of life as infrastructure. Uh, to survive the effects of climate change and disasters and keep cities viable. This idea, you know, of course, is sort of the dominant, currently dominant um, discourse around adaptation really has replaced sustainability in a lot of places, uh, you know, and has a, a huge amount of uh, critical work done on it, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the sense that it is, of course, it's a, it's a changing, shifting, you know, term with not one single meaning, but that is, you know, being deployed in cities and, and, and uh, you know, major financial centers to essentially shore up the, the status quo and, and maintain existing, existing systems while making the world catastrophic, while making life potentially unlivable, just, you know, building some seawalls and that kind of thing. In any case, Miami has been an interesting place to look at, the, the res, at resilience, which is really so dominant, and to see how it's being attempted, how they're attempting to build resilience, but also how there are limits to resilience that are kind of appearing, um, or at least being perceived as appearing. And, 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 you know, so we're really maybe, I think, in Miami, able to see the potential for a shift towards a different paradigm of adaptation. Uh, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, but just to give you a quick sense of the, the sort of projects that are going on there, um, to to try to you know, maintain everything as usual, maintain investor confidence, tourist confidence. This is one of the biggest things, right? Especially in Miami Beach, but all Miami, you know, it's the, 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 the economy is so dependent on tourism and real estate and investment. If those things, um, if the confidence in those uh, sectors falls apart, 
it's over. You know, that's the biggest, that's the biggest question for a city like Miami. So, you know, it's a place of image. It's a city of image. It's a spectacular city. And, and what matters probably most is maintaining that, that, that sense that everything is fine. Um, so there have been some, some sort of spectacular uh, new infrastructural experiments going on. Um, the former mayor of Miami Beach, Mayor Levine, uh, was in charge of this new sort of project called Miami Beach Rising Above, which has been, it's an ongoing effort to elevate the streets of Miami Beach. So this is one of his promo shots for that, right? Like everything looks really good. Everything is, is great. Um, here's another nice shot from, from this project. So these are some of these very nice restaurants in, in Miami Beach, um, uh, about I think 19th street, something like that, where they've elevated the roadways a couple of feet. So when you're eating now, you're eating below the, the street. Um, and this has reduced flooding significantly, actually, although it has caused some flooding coming down into, you know, the areas that are now below ground and into restaurants and, and this sort of thing. Um, some other, some other, you know, more, so let's say sort of uh, less gray infrastructure, more, more ecological infrastructure experiments are going on as well. Um, and this one is, is actually extremely interesting. Um, and it has to do with a threat to Miami's um, infrastructure that is coming uh, not from just like flooding water in the street, but the problem of saltwater infiltration into the city's drinking water supply, which, uh, you know, many commentators kind of think may be one of the more critical issues facing the city, because um, if you don't have water to drink, you don't have a viable city, or you have, you know, water for, for only a very few who can afford it, right? Um, so the problem here is that, again, because of the, the unique situation of Miami, uh, the limestone, the porous limestone base, that's where the aquifer is, the, the fresh water lies underground there. But it's, as you can see in this diagram here, being infiltrated by salt water coming, moving west from the sea into the fresh water like this. Um, and already the city has had to move um, a large number, I think almost all of its um, uh, fresh water wells uh, west to the extreme western border uh, away from the encroaching salt water. Uh, Miami Beach used to have its own walls, but those are all now on the, the mainland of Miami, uh, quite far west. So this is a real problem and it's advancing um, uh, little by little over time. Um, and so one of the big, the big projects is to try to deal with this by um, restoring the, the nearby Everglades ecosystem. So I don't know if anyone watching this has ever been uh, to South Florida. Um, or is familiar with the Everglades, they're a very iconic wetland ecosystem that covers, that used to cover the majority of South Florida in slow moving water that, that, that kind of slowly went through wetlands southward and then emptied out into the, the ocean. Um, but this is what was drained and dammed and rerouted um, to build Miami and, and the, the urbanized development of South Florida as we know it um, today. So they have been uh, disrupted and rerouted to the point where very little of that water actually moves southward. Um, and, and the hope of designers and scientists, this is a, a really large scale effort. It's um, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Project um, being managed by the Army Corps of Engineers, the federal government um, being you know, participated in and worked on by scientists all across South Florida. The hope is that by restoring these natural water flows, it will provide more fresh water pressure against the encroaching salt water coming right from the, the ocean and push back against uh, its infiltration into drinking water. So this this is this very anthropocenic uh, nature as infrastructure idea, which is interesting in its own right. Um, and I think we're seeing uh, the development of a lot of projects like this, um, where what you end up having is, you know, the designation of good and bad natures, nat natural and unnatural natures, um, and the the pitting of one against another. So similarly, that some work I did in the past is on the use of oysters as living infrastructure. In New York City, right to to try to attenuate uh, storm surge and um, rising seas, and I think these are a sort of like unique kind of class of infrastructure that we're seeing emerging right now. Um, where you know, so in this case, you have um, the designation of this natural sort of Holocene pre-modern nature, which is the, the what are so-called natural Everglades flows, right? As they are, they were seen to have flowed before, um, you know, interference for for modern development pitted against these sort of anthropocenic natures, this encroaching seawater, rising seas, and so on and so forth, and, and the, the attempt to sort of uh, restore those natural processes, harness them, and use them to, to mitigate the, the, the anthropocenic uh, intrusions. And so this is, a, this is a really interesting project in its own right, and uh, it, in some sense, it's, a, it, it's really shifting the, the city-nature relationship, or at least how it's imagined, because in the past, the Everglades was the sort of quintessential not city, right? It was the outside the city, 
it is actually still where there's an urban uh, development boundary line uh, beyond which you know, there's Miami on this side and then there's Everglades on this side and development can go no further. You know, they're always pushing it further and further westward, but there is actually literally a line there, right? So the Everglades were, you know, previously considered this like uninhabitable, terrible, awful swamp that, you know, had to be to be drained. Now they're being considered crucial to the survival of the city and being brought into the city, um, not for the sake of sustainability for their own right necessarily, not just for some beautiful restoration project, but um, as a critical infrastructural uh, system needed for the city. So it's like a sort of nature as infrastructure stack being brought in. So it's really changing the, the thinking of the city, it, we, might, we might say. Um, so one of the things, oh, I'm sorry, that shouldn't have sound. Let me turn off the sound on that little video here, sorry. Um, just one second. I was okay. going to just include a a nice video as a visual for you um, here. This is a uh, an excerpt from a short film called Tropical Malaise by the Miami artist Domingo Castillo, who I think is uh, the greatest artist of Miami. Uh, <laughs> Who, who is out there. And I think this is by far um, the most beautiful and important film about Miami as it, as it is right now. And the, the problematization of Miami is climate change ground zero. Um, and I, I think that it is a, it's a very beautiful background to, to illustrate uh, the, the points that I wanted to make about some of these projects and about some of the discourse around Miami right now. Um, the thing about these projects is so many of them are based on you know, certain developments which are happening now, but so many of them are really based on projections of the future, speculations of the future, uh, renderings of the future. So in this in this, this film, um, which you can watch online if, if you would like, uh, what you see is that these, these shots that we see so often of Miami's future um, underwater, you know, these sort of South Beach Art Deco hotels, uh, underwater waves crashing uh, over, you know, palm trees, you know, this kind of thing. These are, these are created. And so this, this film is very beautiful because you kind of see the back end of that. You see this as a digital rendering, all the pieces made in these sort of different um, design firms, all the projects that they're, that they're creating. Um, and it, it is, I think, a very important thing to remember uh, about what's happening in Miami right now, um, that, that so many discourses right now are predicting that the future is unviable, that the city is doomed. And these are, you know, being used as the sort of launching pad for some of these um, new projects that are going on, these resiliency projects and so on, but also for a different discourse, which sort of coexists with the idea that you can make the city resilient. And this discourse said the city cannot be resilient. Um, the, the discourse says that this is the future of Miami, this underwater, nothing on the waves, nothing but waves. It's just um, no humans, nothing left, right? And so you see this a lot, you see, so a lot of these resilience projects are being designed, like the Miami Beach ones are being designed for only the next 30 or 40 years. Um, and after that, you, you hear repeatedly sort of politicians sort of say, I, I, I believe in human ingenuity, I'm sure they're gonna figure something out, right? Um, and, you know, you get a lot of maps and, and visuals that show, you know, by 2100, a lot of Miami will be fully flooded. Um, and so a lot of times you hear that people say it doesn't matter what's going to happen. The city at the end of the day is doomed. And, and this is very interesting because this jars in some ways with um, the urban resilience vision, uh, because, you know, we, we one of the definitions of resilience that is that is used by um, uh, uh, some some folks in Miami at the Sea Level Solutions Center and, and different uh, planning entities is that we are going to have incremental uh, adaptive change, incremental um, uh, adaptive infrastructures where little by little they'll we'll just change them over time. So we left space for five pumps, you know, but we only built four pumps, you know, and then when the water gets higher, we'll add in more, you know, and so on and so forth. And and there's this sense that, 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 that just like urbanization can kind of expand and slowly swallow more and more of the earth over time. So can resilience expand and adapt and just very cybernetically, um, you know, recalibrate itself to the changing environmental conditions and always persist and cities can always remain, economies can always remain, uh, finance and, you know, development can always remain. Um, you know, in some sense, we don't hear very often that there's any other way. It's like the Rockefeller Foundation has a film and they say in it, it the film is called The Resilience Age, and then they say there is no other way, right? And this is, this is very common. 
But so when you see, you know, some of these discussions about Miami's future, there is a sense that there maybe is another way. Uh, what that is is unclear or that there are many other ways, but that resilience may not be one of them. Um, so, you know, the, the predictions for the city uh, in terms of projected for sea rise are 10 to 17 inches by 2040, 2 to 54 inches by 2070, 40 to 136 inches by 2120. Um, you know, these are all projections. Again, these are all projections. We have no idea what's going to happen. We really don't. But these are the basis of a lot of uh, new ways of thinking, um, you know, new kinds of proposals for design as well. Um, so some of the work that I have been doing has been around some of the, the thinking around this sort of doom, Miami is doomed discourse. Um, but I thought before I, I talk about uh, that some of these visuals and some of these proposals that are coming out on the basis of that, I thought it would make sense to talk just momentarily about um, the the horrible events that have transpired in Miami over the last week um, in uh, at the the Champlain Tower South uh, condo building collapse. And I'm sure a lot of people have seen this in the news. Um, it is horrible, uh, tragic, unthinkable thing which has happened. Um, this building, which is right on the ocean, the beach is right in the foreground uh, of this picture. Um, this is at, I think, 88th Street in uh, Surfside, which is right above Miami Beach uh, on the same barrier island. I, I lived a few, few minutes south of, of here. Um, it collapsed in the middle of the night, 1.30 in the morning. Um, this, this whole front section, which is actually quite large, it's not, um, you know, it wasn't flush with the, the part of the building that is remaining here. It was, it stuck out quite further. Uh, it collapsed in the middle of the night while hundreds, I think, of residents were sleeping in their beds. Um, there are currently 16, I believe, people confirmed to, to have died in this and 149, I believe, uh, still unaccounted for. They have been uh, going through the, the tons and tons of concrete wreckage uh, for the past several days looking for survivors, but so far uh, they have not found any. It is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really unthinkable tragedy. Um, and in Miami Beach, it is very raw. It is very, very real what's happening. Um, they, they don't know, no one knows exactly what caused this to happen. This is, I think, the biggest building failure, structural failure in the United States history. It's, I, I believe, uh, aside from the World Trade Center uh, collapse, or, I mean, attack, <laughs> And uh, Oklahoma City bombing. So there, in the in the the days since this horrible collapse, there have been a lot of discussions in the media uh, about what might have caused it, um, and it has brought up a lot of uh, speculation that sea rise might be uh, involved in some way or another. We don't know. Um, you know, there are there are a lot of things being discussed. Uh, certainly, the fact of um, the you know, in a lot of things are built without a lot with cutting a lot of corners, with a lot of corruption, with a ton of handouts in Miami, that is very, very, very common in the city. It, it defines the city in some ways. Um, there, so there's that structural failure, bad construction. It's a 40 year old building, so not that old, but still built before um, Hurricane Andrew uh, hit in 92. And this led to uh, a new set of building, more strict, uh, stricter building codes uh, to be able to withstand hurricanes. So it could be shoddy construction. It could be uh, most structural engineers and people commenting on this believe that it had to have been some kind of combination of multiple factors. It couldn't have just been one. Um, one of the things that you're seeing though in the media is a is a, a renewed problematization of the sea rise issue and its impact on urban structures. Um, you're seeing a lot of discussions about how uh, salt water affects concrete and, and the rebar in it. Um, and it can deteriorate concrete, cause spalling, which causes concrete to disintegrate and rebar to rust and expand. And then, you know, it can cause a support beam to, you know, potentially collapse. There have been a lot of interviews in the media uh, with um, building maintenance people who had repeatedly been really horrified by the amount of flooding in the underground parking garage below this building. And this is something that now a lot of Miami Beach residents, um, including some of my friends, are, are talking about because it happens a lot during king tides um, that you know that that, that that image I showed a little bit ago of the octopus in the parking garage this sort of regular flooding um, in the underground parking garages happens and you know quite frequently um, and a lot of people are beginning to you know look at their their buildings and think you know can I can I go to sleep at night here you know what, what's going on um, 
uh, and so there was a lot there are there are photos from uh, an inspection report showing a lot of um, spalling in the concrete underground and and this sort of thing and, and there had been um, quite uh, according to the engineers and uh, building maintenance people quite a lot of uh, water underground quite often uh, some scientists at FIU had also at Florida International University in Miami had also noted that um the for some reason the the there was uh, exceptional amount of subsidence under this building meaning that the land was sinking just a little bit and this this is happening across Miami Beach in different areas but it was localized under this building in this particular area it's happening in different parts of Miami Beach probably because of the fact that um the, the the barrier island uh, has been built up on on reclaimed wetlands and and this sort of thing, um, and the the you know the the study from uh, it was Sh uh, Shimon Wadawinski uh, at FIU he published that in 2020 and it was actually about sea rise and how subsidence might uh, actually increase sea rise risks to to urban areas. In any case, this the, all of this, you know, this is still ongoing. There are still almost 150 people unaccounted for. And yet in the media, there have been a lot of attempts to almost use this event to talk about climate change and to, you know, almost sort of say, you know, um, we told you so or something like that. And it's 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 a it's very, very jarring uh, situation uh, compared to what people are feeling on the ground. And yet at the same time, there, you know, it, it is worth noticing that after disasters like this, you know, just like Sandy, which was not even um, like this. In New York, you had a, a real shift in the discourse around climate adaptation, a real shift away from sustainability toward resilience. And so, and, and, you know, a, a real new problematization of cities and what urban resilience could mean. And so, um, you know, looking at the, the media discourse on this right now, um, there will be a huge investigation. There will be shifts in building uh, codes and enforcement and maybe even building standards, things like this. It, you know, it it is possible to see that this may be um, a moment of a, a shifting discourse too. I mean, you're seeing actually a lot of articles saying, you know, are barrier islands, you know, viable places to live? Is Miami Beach going to be viable as a place to live? Is, you know, and, and maybe it had nothing to do with that. Maybe it did, we don't know, but this this is coming into the, 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 the discussion a lot. Um, and this idea that Miami is doomed in general, um, has led to a, a proposal that you that I have heard about quite a bit, that I heard about quite a bit when I first moved to Miami, that I began researching. Um, so I'll, I'll shift away from the the situation in in Surfside right now um, to to discuss this proposal because I think it um, brings up some interesting questions, and I don't think there's one necessary interpretation of this proposal. Um, some there are there are potentially productive readings of it and very dark readings of it. And, and I think that's present at the same time. And it's, it's important to keep that in our minds as we we, we look at this proposal. Um, but it's uh, it's an idea that has come from um, uh, a man named uh, Tom Gustafson, who is the former speaker of the Florida House of Representatives uh, and uh, director of the Institute of Environment at Florida International University. Um, and, you know, he is a, is a big believer in climate change and, and you know, and uh, the, the extreme, you know, worst case scenario sort of projections. And he, he really believes that, you know, given the elevations uh, of South Florida, given greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you know, uh, sea rise feedback over the coming decades, he believes that by 2100, there's, there's really little likelihood that South Florida is going to be habitable. So what he has proposed is the uh, transformation of Miami into the islands of South Florida. Uh, and so this is a proposal that I have heard discussed actually from a, a couple of different quite uh, quite quite smart uh, planners and and, and uh, scientists in Miami as well. But uh, Gustafson is sort of the main proponent of it. And and his his idea is this. His idea is that look, this place is doomed. It's going to become more and more unlivable. So there needs to be a preemptive action taken. Um, it, we need to, he says transform all of Miami uh, into fill. So we need to really just bulldoze the city, uh, condemn most of the city, <laughs> um, and use it as fill to create a new series of elevated islands, the islands of South Florida. On these islands would be elevated um, uh, uh, high rises, really, really big high rises, series of high rises. Uh, they'd be connected by large new um, uh, uh, bridges, He's a transportation planner, that's his background, so he's thinking about this a lot. Um, and uh, the 
you know, the islands will also need to disconnect from these, these planetary infrastructural networks as well. Um, when I when I spoke with him about this, it was the very beginning of COVID uh, happening, uh, COVID-19 happening. And, and he was saying, look, you see what's happening with COVID. We need to um, uh, disconnect. We need to uh, disconnect from these global logistics. We need to relocalize. Um, you know, and, and he's not alone in thinking that this has been a, a very widespread response to, to not only COVID, but the, you know, all the different kind of infrastructural disruptions and things of the uh, and disasters of recent year. Um, so, so in his view, he thinks that the, the high rises uh, need to be centered around a localized forms of production, um, tabletop design, 3D printing, manufacturing tools that are able to be used by everyone. <laughs> um, power will be generated through wind and solar and fourth generation nuclear on the little islands. Um, the, the islands will be uh, storm resistant architecture, uh, able, able to withstand the increasingly strong, strong storms that we'll be seeing in the region in the coming years and decades. Um, a seed bank of crops suited to the region's long-term climate change, altered growing conditions, uh, a library of Alexander held electronically and so on and so forth. Um, so this is the vision, right? Um, that Miami's doomed clear it away, use it to create these new islands. Something he also mentions um, is the idea of this being a, a sort of bulwark, as he describes it, for um, the, the, the pirates of the Caribbean, as he puts it, uh, who will be uh, coming with the failure of island states uh, in the future due to climate change. Um, so there will be military bases, as he sees it too, on some of these islands, uh, and they will use automated uh, self-driving vehicles to get uh, supplies around within the, the, the island territory. Um, so this is an interesting idea. A, uh, it's, um, it's just a speculation, right? It's just a vision, but it is a, an interesting example of, um, you know, how these, these, these speculations of, of urban, uh, urban, urban geographies already being doomed lead to proposals that then, you know, maybe down the line become real, real plans. Um, so I have thought about this a little bit in terms of, um, you know, this urban age discourse and this idea of planetary urbanization. And, you know, what I think that we, we, we can see in this, this proposal is rather than urban resilience, you know, urban resilience being the idea that you, you retrofit existing urban geographies with ever new dynamic infrastructures uh, to, to, to maintain them throughout turbulence. Instead of urban resilience here is the kind of anthropocenic herbicide. Herbicide, of, of course, being um, the, the sort of killing of a city, uh, the attacking of a city. Stephen Graham and different other uh, writers have done a lot of research on the idea. And usually it's a term that either comes from, describes like military action in places like Baghdad or, you know, uh, Israeli attacks on Palestinian uh, towns and cities. Um, the bulldozing of, of terrain, this kind of thing. Um, and we also, you know, you can think of also Marshall Berman's work on, you know, things like creative destruction and uh, bulldozing of slums and urban renewal and, and gentrification and all this type of thing. Um, right. But in this case, it's a, I think we see a sort of anthropocenic version of, of herbicide that is not just about the bulldozing of a particular neighborhood or a particular settlement or a particular infrastructure, but an entire urban geography uh, on the basis of it being doomed by environmental uh, impacts, by non-human forces, right? Um, and so I think that, that we can think about this herbicide in a couple of different ways, uh, two different ways in particular. Uh, uh, you know, first we can to see the obvious, the, 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 the just leveling of the, of the city. So, and you know, it, it, it is really important to think about what that would really entail. Um, that would be all the memories of Miami, all the, streets, all the buildings where the people have lived, the places where uh, Elian Gonzalez was uh, uh, kept, you know, and, and, and then uh, re retaken, you know, right? And the, the, the streets where, you know, riots have occurred, the streets where, uh, you know, uh, so many things happened, so many, so many lives have taken place, bulldozed levels, right? Um, so, so many of the, the good and bad uh, parts of Miami, the Art Deco hotels, the slums, you know, the everything um, gone. And it's interesting to, to note that this is actually in some ways not really a new vision of, of Miami, but it's, a, it's like a continuation of the city's um, development. Uh, because, you know, like I had said before, um, 
Miami was built on drained swampland and, and shaped so much by capital and by uh, creative destruction itself. Um, the Everglades had to be uh, filled in and, and rerouted and, and brought to the point of uh, near um, collapse, which is where they are now uh, to build the city. Um, and, you know, uh, a lot of Miami Beach was built on fill, so millions of cubic yards of fill, sand, dredged from the bay, uh, brought in and, and arranged in this sort of level, at the time, level uh, terrain. You know, the streets and sidewalks and all the condos built on this as well. And, you know, and this was, you know, to create this place that could be advertised for, for real estate speculation and, you know, and so on and so forth. So in, in some ways, it's an interesting, like, continuation of that rather than something quite, quite so new. Um, but I also think that we can think about the herbicidal component here, the herbicidal vision, um, not just in terms of the, 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 the bulldozing and, and transformation of the city itself, but also in the aspect of, of Tom Gustafson's vision of cutting these, these infrastructural linkages that we really constitute planetary urbanization. So, you know, planetary urbanization is, is, you know, so much this concept that helps us very, very usefully, very productively understand um, the state of, you know, uh, neoliberal and, and post-neoliberal uh, capitalism today, these, these planetary infrastructural networks, um, of you know uh, that that link you know very far away hinterlands to urban agglomerations that that you know transform areas into you know oil fields and and so on and bring these through pipelines connecting them to to urban life and so on and so forth. Um, but it's so much a concept about relationality and um, interconnectivity, right? And and part of this vision is this this deliberate cutting of those links, right? Um, breaking from that planetary formation. And, and 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 relocalizing really, and, and you know this is a is a, a vision that, that is also not new. Or it's a it's a, a, a envisioned strategy that's not new in the sense that you know right now we're seeing islandization be uh, really an ascendant trend uh, in so many different ways, right? If you think everything from like uh, it, you know bunkers, luxury bunkers, to um, the Seasteading Institute with its the dream of you know, creating these island cities free from like government taxation, uh, the sort of libertarian vision, um, or you think Echo Atlantic City, uh, which is this um, development, this corporation and bank uh, funded development off the coast of Lagos, Nigeria, to build this, you know, elite uh, seawalled brand new city out of fill, um, you know, that, you know, would just be for the rich to, to be spared the site of Lagos's poor, to be spared the, you know, the inundation of sea rides. You know, these, these kinds of things are, you know, uh, on the rise, and especially with COVID, you know, it was just like a an, a, an exaggeration of a trend already underway. Um, but, you know, I think we also might want to point out, though, that, you know, this sort of disconnecting from planetary urbanization is not just some kind of, it's not only a matter of evil paradises, to use like Mike Davis's term here. Um, it's also something that, you know, let's say leftist uh, uh, projects and, and 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 strategies are also pursuing in different ways. You know, you, everything from autonomy movements. You know, uh, you know, even Zapatista type thing. You might think there, uh, or you know, local kind of homesteading, or you know, attempts to build sustainability kind of cities. You know, there's so there's a lot of variations, right? I mean, and you know, and the 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 big, you know, really useful insight uh, of uh, Ross uh, Adams, the uh, the urban theorists um, about planetary urbanization is that, you know, this isn't just a matter of, you know, capital accumulation, of course it is, right? But planetary urbanization is also a planetary system of control and discipline and governance, you know, and in which we are enmeshed and in which it's very hard to, to escape. And so, you know, there are, there are, you know, very good reasons for, for considering trying to leave it um, as well. So in any case, this, this, this is a vision, it's just a vision, it's building it on, on an islandization trend of breaking with planetary urbanization. Um, and Miami, as I, I showed this, this image a little bit ago, Miami has its own kind of version, so sort of prefigurations of this already. This is Fisher Island. Uh, it's a small um, private uh, members only island right off the tip of Miami Beach. Um, and you know it's it's like just really big billionaires live there. I think Oprah had a place there at one point. Um, they have their own uh, medical clinic. And during the early days of COVID, when it was really impossible to get just a test in Miami, if you were just a normal person, they got all their you know their residents and all the the workers uh, free tests, and you know then early vaccination and this kind of thing. 
So it's sort of like the medical island early version of this, even in Miami as well. And Miami is a place of a lot of gated communities uh, as well. Um, but all of this is just, you know, we, it's hard. You, there is no one uh, interpretation, I think, of this, this, this proposal for Miami's future. Um, I think it gives us food for thought. It helps us consider, um, you know, the possibility that rather than just endless urban resilience, urban destruction might be also on the the, the table as a, a defining characteristic of the Anthropocene. Um, and, you know, that planetary urbanization may be a specific historically, uh, historically specific and finite uh, geographical and political economic formation. And that with the Anthropocene, we may see other ones breaking with it, splintering out of it. And that all of these processes, you know, building urban resilience, potential herbicide, failed cities, all of these are part of the same, the same reality, uh, even though they may look and feel like different realities from the vantage point in each of them, right? Because um, that's very much how reality seems to be unfolding in, in the present uh, in, in many ways. Um, so the, the last thing that I would say, and then I'll stop talking because I have been talking a long time, uh, is that on a more, on, on a less Miami specific note, um, I think that this herbicidal vision has potentially interesting ramifications for how we think about design and how we even think about like political strategies or, or approaches in the Anthropocene. Um, so I, I, you know, I, one of the things that we see really often when it comes to the Anthropocene and Anthropocene critical theory is that, uh, you know, the idea that we need to make new, new forms of life is, is really um, common. The Anthropocene calls us to make new forms of living, new ways of living in and with the earth, et cetera. Um, but the, I, interestingly, I think that there has been far less focus on uh, not not the, the the production side, but the destruction side, not the creation side, but the decreation side. Um, and in some ways, this this herbicidal vision um, makes me think about this and 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 wonder if we need to explore it more as a uh, you know design for destruction as being an anthropocenic. Um, uh, need as well, right? So, you know, we tend to think about, you know, these these sort of negative uh, forms of destruction as like, sort of like only a social movement sort of thing. You know, you see an uprising, you know, last summer, as we saw with the George Floyd uprising, um, you know, uh, structures burning down, this kind of thing um, being burned down. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that there are other ways in which the, this, this depresencing as a uh, Alexander Monin puts it, uh, might become very important too for the Anthropocene if we if we stop and look around at the the really catastrophic infrastructures and structures around us. Um, so this is something I have been thinking about uh, with regard to uh, the, this this work. But as I just mentioned, from Alexander Monin, um, coming from France, he's a he's a researcher um, at ESC Clermont. It's a business school near, near Lyon, and he and some of his colleagues just put out this book. Um, which I have found incredibly interesting. It's called uh, An Ecology of Dismantling. Uh, and, and they, so what they have been exploring is this idea of depresencing uh, 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 the, the, the sort of already obsolete infrastructures of neoliberal capitalism. The, the infrastructure is driving the Anthropocene, producing the Anthropocene, but also producing the immiseration of, of, of human existence on earth. Um, and so what they have done is try to take up this, this, um, this negative, uh, approach. And so it kind of comes out of an engagement with uh, Giorgio Gammon's idea of destitution, destituent power. Um, but they found this to be a little bit um, sort of, let's say, uh, not operationalizable in, in the practical real, real world. So they said maybe um, depresencing or your closing worlds is, a, is an important thing to think about for the Anthropocene. And so they're, they have a new Anthropocene design and strategy program at their, their university, which they've just started, um, where the students really work on you know, these, they work with like businesses or like towns uh, on how to like shut down some of these infrastructures or these, these structures. Um, so how to put this into practice. Um, they call their project sort of the last startup. So it's like a startup to, to close everything down. Um, and then I think, you know, in some ways this is a really interesting, you know, sort of project and vision and, and it could be expanded and it could expand our thinking about what design is, not how do we just shore up and preserve 
what is senselessly for no reason, you know, it, including why would we preserve the structures that are destroying us in the world, but instead why, why, how is it possible that instead of just living in the ruins, how is it possible that this uh, shutting these down and, 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 you know, sort of destructive design has not been more of a, you know, kind of even in, even theoretically a response to, to the Anthropocene. Uh, um, you know, and I think it's funny because in some ways um, it, it, it's very easy to read this vision of the islands of South Florida. Uh, again, it's a sort of evil, evil paradise for the rich and, and forced migration. And that's probably the, the best reading, right? But on the other hand, there are, there are possibilities in it that you could see, you know, um, the, the Tom Gustafson, the, 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 the guy behind the, the big vision of it, you know, he's also a big Greta Thunberg uh, fanatic. And he, he also really uh, is, is, is quite adamant about trying to um, stop catastrophic climate change. And, you know, he, he had said, you know, the, the, the best response to Florida, the state of Florida's refusal to act on climate change, quote, is I have a solution for that. We all need to march up to the Capitol in Tallahassee and burn the fucker down. That's the only way we're going to save South Florida. You know, I mean, it's a bit of, of hyperbole, but, it, you know, it, it, it gives you a sense of what he's thinking uh, and, and, and the sort of stakes of everything. Um, and so in any case, to, to wrap up, I think putting this idea of, um, you know, design as, as closing down on the table it, it, in the urban context and, and in any context, really, uh, for the Anthropocene is an interesting beginning to, for thought. Uh, um, and, you know, whether or not the Anthropocene will be urban or planetary urbanization will be the dominant uh, formation going forward, I think, uh, you know, it's not something we should assume, you know, we should not ever assume that, but opening it up as a question might also provide some, some, some fertile grounds for, for thinking other responses to the Anthropocene. Uh, so I will stop talking now, uh, and, and maybe we can discuss some of these or, or other ideas that are, that are related uh, in the time that we have left. I'll stop sharing my screen as well here. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you so much. Awesome. Um, uh, like Peter Watts' talk yesterday, um, uh, a bit overwhelming. Um, and shocking um, in terms of what the proper response could be. Um, and let me just, um, can you hear me? Can, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, I'm, let me jump through my notes here because I've been taking you know, tons of notes during your talk. Um, oh yeah, here we go, here we go. Um, yeah, in yesterday's talk with Peter, he started off by framing everything against um, climate change and irreversible um, systems collapse in the next century, and you know he he gave us a lot of statistics and you know advance uh, heads up on leaks of the next IPCC report, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, basically said, well, so what can we do? Um, and he proposed as one way of approaching this that um, human cognitive ability has been limited historically by evolution to think about kin selection and preservation. And that across the past few hundred thousand years, at least that's been the way we survived because we protected our kin and um, we had a specific time frame for self-interest, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a set of concepts that are familiar, I think to everybody. Um, so he, he started <coughs> meditating on what it would mean to um, neurally tweak uh, the human mind, cognitive architecture, such that it might make it possible for humans to be more collectively realistic or even pessimistic. Um, he championed pessimism as a form of realism, which I think we probably all could get on board with, um, while also maintaining a drive to build. So, you know, he put it in fairly profane um, terms. He said, you know, can we get off on denying ourselves the second house? Can we actually get pleasure out of not only a kind of ascetic approach to being, but also a commitment of energy to certain forms of change, um, degrowth, et cetera, that are very, very much related to what you're talking about. And then he jumped into the question of what it would mean for humans to be a successful star-faring civilization. And so he took that idea of um, tweaking human 
cognitive architecture as it has evolved to, um, you know, to science fiction levels sort of territory, which he's very good at because he's a, he's a great science fiction writer. But I, I'm wondering where there are points where we connect back that question to your thinking, because, you know, in a way, uh, yes, if the overview effect is about finding a place to, to float from or stand from or fly from or swim through where you get a different perspective. I, I always remember my mom telling me once um, similar kind of overview effect thing that she went snorkeling once in, in a place. It wasn't near Florida, I think, but it was a place where things dropped off really fast. You know, it was the edge of a, a kind of a reef that dropped off, not into a true abyss, but someplace, someplace where you couldn't see the bottom. You know, it just was total deep blue, nothing. And she said it was one of the most terrifying things she had ever um, experienced. And that shift of scale thinking is crucial. You know, and again, I mentioned this yesterday, Donella Meadows in Limits to Growth points that out in their report that humans mostly can only think about close kin a few months or a few years out. But, you know, what we need to do is we need to think about planetary relations decades or centuries out or even more. And so I'm wondering um, where there might be a link to urban form or even or herbicide and rebuilding, un, unbuilding, rebuilding, destruction, creative destruction, rebuilding, where there might be a link for you between what you've talked about and different cognitive positions, platforms, different structures of feeling in, in the, you know, kind of Ray, Raymond Williams sense, like because a city with an economy and a set of cultures builds a structure of feeling and then everyone, whether they know it or not, they participate, hundreds of thousands of people could all be part of a communal structure of feeling, which is a kind of a super organism in a way. It's a cognitive architecture. And if Miami has a set of overlapping structures of feeling that are definitely linked to the terroir, the, the city, the terrain, the history of the city, all of that, as all cities do, um, then what would it mean to remove part of it and rebuild part of it? Uh, and what cognitive architecture might emerge out of that, or what cognitive architecture might be necessary? You know, what shift in consciousness might might be necessary to mobilize it? Because I don't know. I mean, it sounds like the Gustafsson character that you mentioned has already had that kind of you know uh, rev revelation. Really, um, sounds a little Blade Runner, twenty forty nine to me, but. Uh, If you could talk about that a little bit, I'd be really interested. Yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, one of the things about Miami, well, I'm sure people feel this way about any city, but to me, one of the things about Miami is that it's, just, it's, it's enthralling. It is so beautiful. It is so humid. It is so designed wrong. It is so rich and alive and you know, it's a place where the sky every single day will overwhelm you with the the the, the clouds and the sunsets and the rain and the storms and the, yeah. the 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 iguanas and the plants will overrun anything unless anything that is built or landscaped unless there's this incessant long crew that's being paid to to manicure these homes that seem yeah. to have no inhabitants in them. Um, it is. Uh, I think the most incredible and most unique city. It is. It has such a a, a taste and flavor, like you're saying, of it, of its own, and that is so the product of its, its history. It is a you know extremely. Um, it's it's super shaped by immigration from Latin America, Cuba, um, everything from the smells to the uh, you know the food to the people to the language, everything. I mean, and it's it's an incredible place. So there's nothing like it. Um, it's a it's a it's a great city, and also a lot of the like I said, a lot of the development that has happened has really it's a shame. It's a shame what it's done. It's made it it's made it a difficult city to live in, where you know despite all this beauty, you know a lot of the times you'll find yourself as a as an ordinary person just going to work, living there. That your time is spent in your car, stuck in traffic, mm. uh, or stuck behind a, a yet another car wreck because there's just endless car wrecks, yeah. or stuck in traffic behind a a bridge that's been brought up to let a really rich person's yacht through while you're waiting to get to your job at, you know, Publix or whatever, you know, and that, that is often the, the experience uh, that it's incredibly expensive. Uh, a lot of the, the natural space has been paved over, turned into strip malls, you know, the paved over paradise is a real thing in a lot of ways in Miami. And that's, it's very sad. Um, 
But when you're there, when you live there, when you have a life there, it's, you don't have this overview effect in the same, or, you know, view, you don't have this overview in the same way where, I don't know. I mean, maybe you don't imagine that just bulldozing the whole city would be a nice thing. <laughs> you think, like, Jesus, that would be like all my, my life and you know, everyone's life and this land and this, this place. And I mean, that's insane. Not only that, but when they're living there, you're, you don't have the overview effect that sort of like bird's eye view that says, uh, you know, just make a clean slate. That sort of like seeing like a state sort of perspective. You, or you also don't necessarily think that the city is doomed. You don't actually necessarily think that life there is impossible. You, you, you may be thinking, well, it's extremely viable. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of strategies for living with water and not in the, the publicized like PR campaign, live with water sense, but in the sense of, you know, houseboats have a long tradition there, uh, you know, stilt houses have a long tradition there, um, you know, all kinds of things, fishing, you know, uh, the Mikisuki, uh Native Americans who live there have all kinds of, you know, different experiences and knowledges and, and technologies, uh, old and new, uh, for, for living in wetlands, you know, and, and for them, they're like, we don't do disaster planning, we don't think that way, we are going to be here, and that's a fact, you know, I mean, and, and they are, very powerful uh, thinkers of sovereignty and, and autonomy and, and, and certainly will be there, you know, uh, going into the future. Um, so, so when you, you know, so I guess in the sense of, you know, when you're there, when you live there, when you're adapted to that environment, you don't necessarily see it from above as a, just like bulldoze it, right? We just, you know, move everybody out, manage the retreat, send them to, to wherever Orlando, leave a few in, in some buildings. You don't think that way. Um, on the other hand, you know, maybe there is there is a, a need for people living there to 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 think together or with certain, you know, people that they, you know, are connected to there. You know, what really, though, would it mean to live there going into the future if you don't want to be part of the, the people who are whose retreat is managed for them? You know, if you don't want to be subject to that, then, you know, what what kinds of, you know, what kinds of networks might be needed? What kinds of strategies might be needed on the ground? Um, because it, you know, it, it, if if you know some of these things begin happening more frequently, flooding and all this, it, it could be it could be a, a real technical issue. Let's say. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if that answers your question yeah. fully, but yeah. It it does it does in part. I mean, it links to other um, obviously other cultures that predate the modern period of Miami that had developed their own tactical ways of responding to an extremely mutable landscape, you know, an extremely um, complex and mutable natural landscape. I'm also reminded of this um, very small subplot in Kim Stanley Robinson's 2312, where he talks about all of South Florida being rebuilt a few hundred years into the future, after it had, of course, completely been submerged, because there were enough people who wanted Florida back, right? And they were basically they were on trains, if I remember this moment in the novel, it's pretty brief, but they were moving earth and stone from the Rockies to Florida to rebuild Florida. And I don't remember why they were hollowing out the Rockies, but there was some like quasi geoengineering project at that moment in the novel. And, um, and it's really beautiful. I mean, you know, it, this is, there's this moment where some of the characters are on the train and the trains are getting heckled by people that the, the who live in towns that the trains are passing through, you know, and he, he has this really interesting way of talking about how people agonistically will disagree with each other as the train rolls through, moving literally mountains worth of earth to rebuild the peninsula, you know? And it's a, it's a super, super interesting thing I found in, in his writing um, that he would imagine, well, there might just be enough people who really want Florida back in a few hundred years who loved Miami, the memory of Miami and their legacy in it enough, and presumably like their grandparents and their great parents, grandparents' legacies in it, uh, that they would re just rebuild the whole damn peninsula. You know, uh, it's the idea of, you know, in science fiction, we love Venice so much, you know, we literally moved it off planet and we floated it in orbit, that kind of thing. So it seems absurd on one level, but then a lot of things humans do are pretty absurd. And if you get a few tens of millions of humans all wanting to do the same absurd thing together, then <laughs> absurd things can happen. So I, I just, I'm, I'm meditating on this in the context of the idea of, you know, the kind of herbicide of wiping out the city entirely and rebuilding it as the, as the archipelago of South Florida, you know, that, that kind of thing. 
which yeah, is a I, yeah go ahead no so i was just gonna say yeah i i, I totally remember that and uh that part and uh you know i i can't remember if that was the same part in the book where there were some people who were just beach people because he's always got surfers right and in, in yeah. every book and I, I think that was the same part. Maybe it wasn't, but there were people who were just on the new beaches, became the new beach people or the new coastlines. Uh, and I mean, and I think, I think this is really important because so a couple of times I, I have shared some of this, this work on this idea uh, yeah. with, with other geographers and, and, and a common response is, well, why would you rebuild right there? You know, if this yeah. area is going to be um, so, so, so flood, uh, so, so inundated by storms and things yeah. like that, why would you rebuild yeah. there? Why, you know, yeah. It's like it's not that, it's not that yeah. things are not so rational. Obviously, we we clearly see that humans don't do things only for that reason, for you know rationality, right? We do them for all kinds of irrational, you know, inspir inspired uh, reasons. And and I think that's actually one of the most beautiful things in Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, books. I have recently just read all of them like back to back, and I oh totally love them so much. Oh and I'm finishing the one right now about the 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 reincarnation, and it's a anyways. Um, but um, you know, one of the things that I think is so beautiful in his work that is sometimes not really present in Anthropocene thinking, aside from the sort of like accelerationist uh, perspective, which I, you know, I'm not a part of, um, it, it, is that, that, that there are these incredibly insane projects of, of terraforming, of geoengineering, of whatever, um, dragging, yeah, dragging all the rock from the Rockies to make a new Florida that happen and that are, that are so meaningful to the characters that give this incredible feeling of this being a world historical revolutionary project and then you're yeah. part of it and you're, you're building your own reality and that this is something to be engaged in that is it is worth dying and living for and it's part of the human uh, the meaning of being human and and I, and I love that in his books and and it seems so obvious that that would be something that's on the table right now it has to be on the table not you know not just as a matter of surviving the Anthropocene but as at a moment when it's so obvious that the, the existing structures are just a disaster and they're just only producing more disaster. It seems so obvious that it's a time for, for rethinking and rebuilding. And, you know, I mean, and in some ways, you know, even a city like Miami is maybe, you know, a question worth asking is, you know, what are the parts that, that, that are making it, uh, you know, that are destroying what's beautiful about Miami? How do you get rid of those? Mm -hmm. What are the parts that would be, you know, we're taking into one's own hands as, as people living there and actually, you know, accentuating or, or changing and transforming and, you know, it's, it's, there's certainly going to be people living there, um, no matter what happens in, mm, in the future, yeah. by some means, you know, I mean, there are people who build their own amphibious housing in parts of Louisiana, there are people who live yes. on, 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 on boats, there are people who have invented um, stand up paddleboard fishing in South Florida, you know, it's people, they will, they will do it, and, and perhaps be more attracted to it, because it, it is a project in which you're involved in your existence, rather, it could be, you know, rather than, yeah. Your existence is defined by going to work. I remember you showing some of those stilt houses. I think it was in Louisiana in one of your lectures a couple of years back, and then they were just um, really, really amazing. I, I, I'm, I'm still thinking about this question of, of um, dismantling the ecology of dismantling the depresencing that you talked about. You know, you may know the architect, um, the visionary architect Cedric Price. And for, for everyone here who doesn't know Cedric Price's work, you know, a, a very famous project, at least for myself and my partner, Carla Leitao, uh, was the Potteries Think Belt project, which took advantage of um, rail infrastructure that had fallen into disuse in the English landscape to propose a kind of deployed series of schools and resources. Um, and so, you know, the Potteries Think Belt project is one that at least in the, the architecture and design and urban culture that I come from is always revered as this incredibly important, you know, minimal degrowth kind of related um, efficient project, you know, parasitical in the best way. But people don't always also mention that Cedric Price was a licensed demolition expert. And, you know, so when you think about someone like Price, one has to, I always imagine, think that they always were also thinking about what should be removed or what shouldn't have been built, you know, or if removing, then what shouldn't be built in the future um, in the sense that, you know, uh, we can make do with the almost nothing, but not Mies van der Rohe's almost nothing, a different kind of almost nothing. 
you know. So I, I feel like this question of of what can be um, what can be made out of the almost nothing is really important. I remember also in um, in one of your talks, Stephanie, you were you were bringing up um, the idea of taking the tent down and getting ready for the end of everything and the way that this would be a kind of a ritual. Um, and I actually was, I have my notes from that lecture that you gave a few years ago and I, I highlighted it this morning. Peter Kingsley, we're taking down the tent, cleaning up. We might, won't be going to the next place, but the ritual is important. Wrapping things up properly is the most important moment. And I wonder if you can, you can talk about that because you know, in a way, we all, live, we all live our lives that way. We all know that we have a certain amount of time. And so we're, we're all taking down the tent, even when we're pretty young and cleaning up. And so there's an interesting, it's almost like a Castaneda-esque sense of you know, facing one's own mortality and knowing that actions always take place within a kind of an arc, a circumscribed arc, but that doesn't devalue the moments of beauty and love that we find each day within that arc. So how do we construct a position there? I feel like it's connected in, in a funny way to Peter Watts, although maybe he would take a different position in terms of ideas of like constructing hope or constructing hope through resilience. And you've talked about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I love that, that passage. I'm, it's, it's really nice that you remember that from Peter Kingsley. I, I, he is a, a philosopher who now uh, he, he has been involved in a, a number of different uh, fields looking at the history of uh, ancient Greece and uh, mysticism and, and this sort of thing. And he is, I think, one of the, the most important philosophers who's alive right now. And what's really interesting about him is that he doesn't do any like publicizing of his work now. He just sends out on their uh, mailing list, like, I'll have uh, a new book out. We're not putting this, you know, we're not promoting this. If, if you want to read it, it's out there. I, I have yeah. incredible respect for this man and I, I wish I could meet him someday. Um, but he, he this, this passage that you were quoting was from, he does some of these little audio recordings that you can get on his website. Um, mm -hmm. I really recommend, they're just so good to listen to. He, uh, he covers so much ground and he is such a thinker of this moment in our civilization. And, and what he says in that, in, that, in that passage is he says, you know, it's like everybody knows it that our civilization is, is ending. It's already over. Uh, and we're just acting like it's not. We're just running and running and running without stopping to think. And he says, and he says, this is not the way that, you, that, that one should respond to the end of a civilization as someone who is a part of that civilization. Uh, he says, the most important thing to remember is that the end in any ritual is what matters the most. If you don't end it well, it was all for nothing. He says, he says, uh, yeah. you know, it's taking it, taking up the tent posts, right. And it's holding yeah. it and putting it away. This is a sacred yeah. task. It's, you know, he says, instead of just running and running, and running and trying to maintain things senselessly for no reason, uh, you know, it, it, pulling up the tent pegs and, you know, um, respectfully with dignity, putting it, putting it to rest is, is, you know, uh, perhaps a more proper response to things. Um, what that means is, is an open question, right? But yeah. I think it's a very important, important question. Um, you know, instead of this endless dragging on of something that is so destructive in so many ways, causing so much pain, so much suffering, so much degradation of human life and, and the earth, put it to an end. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's hard to imagine what that means. And some of our old ways of thinking about what that means maybe don't apply or maybe they're not practical right now. I mean, if, if you look at, at a real, you know, clear eyed view of the kind of infrastructural entanglements that we have right now, the things that, that, you know, people rely on, you know, air conditioning, you know, clean water, you know, all these types of things, hospitals, all this, you know, the whole thing probably needs to be re rethought and redesigned and remade if, you know, if it's going to be viable, you know, not just as like a, a nice idea, but as a real civilizational project to try to, 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 to rethink all this or to, to, to start over or something. Um, yeah, it, it seems, yeah. it seems, these, are, these are serious questions, you know, and it's not to be taken lightly and not to be like aestheticized necessarily, right? But yeah, I, I, I really think that's a, a worthwhile passage to return to because mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, I think this, this, you know, mortality question is also something that's come up for so many people, so many of us, 
during the you know the, the pandemic and everything because we have had we've been many of us not everyone but some of us have been gifted with some more time uh, time with our families our friends or ourselves uh, you know just time yeah. and um, yeah. that time you know that's what allows you to, to, to see this open this question of, of, of mortality to think you know you know is this the kind of life I want to be living is this the kind of life is it, you know, do I need to change my life? What kind of life is this going to be? Um, and to, you know, to really ask those you know, very Heideggerian questions of, you know, of being immortal on the earth, right? Is often you don't get to think of them when you're just work, sleep, work, sleep, work, sleep, go to work, work, sleep, right? You know, I mean, um, and so I think that those, that it seems possible that there will be ripple effects from so many people having been asking those questions you know, we're, there's been a lot of articles this week about how a lot of people are trying to change their jobs or, or quitting their jobs because they realized, you know, whether it was through remote work or the, the kind of pressures that they were being put under during COVID when they were forced to go to work that they, that they can't, you know, or, the, or, or realizing they were getting paid so, so little, trying to change it, realizing this is not sustainable. And then I think the ripple effects from this may be, may be large, you know, and yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of these things combined, I, I, I think that there is the potential for a massive, massive shift in, in, in not only how we think about, you know, what we're doing and what it means to be human, but like how we're living and, 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 and allowing this to continue. Yeah, the, the keeping ourselves open to the to to potential, uh, open to the open in the Agamben sense, you know, uh, which I know you've written about. Uh, in the past, yeah. To ask the question as the, um, as the organizer of the Architecture Biennale did, how, how will we live together? Is a very, very interestingly positioned question. Now, obviously the Biennale in 2020 being, the Architecture Biennale being delayed because of the pandemic um, and the responses that some of the pavilions like the Italian pavilion made to go deeper into asking the question, how will we live together when obviously we're not living together in the way that we thought we would be able to in the face of something like a global pandemic um, becomes crucial. And you, I remember you, you wrote um, in this text, the Stituent Power and Common Use, Reading Agamben in the Anthropocene, which you wrote with, what was your co-author's name again? Uh, Bruce Brown. Bruce Brown, yeah. That was Brown, in two, Brown, two, yeah. Brown in 2018. Um, you wrote, near the end of the text, you were talking about Agamemnon's political ontology, and you said this is precisely where the strengths and limits of Agamemnon's political ontology become apparent. Uh, its evident strength lies in its insistence on understanding the world as handy, available for experiments in political life, provided that we learn how to destitute the apparatuses that currently order and delimit our actions, which is very much in keeping with what you talked about today in terms of like identifying infrastructure that is not appropriate for various reasons and degrowthing it, removing it, designing its, you know, sunset, its immediate sunset, designing a replacement for it. Um, you, you then said, indeed, we might go so far as to say that with Agamben's dual emphasis on the inoperativity of the world and the handiness of its elements, he points us to the kind of pragmatic experimental orientation that's required for life in the Anthropocene or what Anna Singh has otherwise called late capitalist ruins. Uh, the language of tipping points and safe operating spaces, after all, assumes a limited and Spartan future in which sustaining current systems within these safe operating spaces becomes both the goal and justification of global management, which is you and, and Brown basically pointing out the, the kind of limits of, of those terms and the limits of those, of those ways of thinking. It's just very interesting to me because, uh, you know, I, I think from the accelerationist perspective, which wants us to speed, you know, the, the beetle and the wedge, example that people like John Brunner were talking about in the 1970s, uh, wants us to speed, you know, full tilt into change, like complete systemic change. Um, there might be ways of accepting that we're going to be forced to speed full tilt a lot of the coming decades, but we might prepare ourselves to identify hinge points as opposed to tipping points, hinge points that might become tipping points so that we can then intervene, you know, extremely strategically and tactically in those tipping points. It feels like, again, the example that, that you talked about um, of the Miami archipelago, you know, South Florida islands. Most people look at that example and say, this isn't a hinge point or tipping point. Like this is a full scale 
annihilation of a city. But if you think about it across a, a century and a half arc, then it is actually just a hinge point among many other hinge points of ocean side cities around the planet. And so it takes on a kind of a different valence that I'm not in any way kind of devaluing the memories every single person has of their life in the city of Miami or any other city around the planet that's gonna be flooded in the next century. But I think you see what I'm kind of getting at. I'm trying to think about the perspective shift, you know, to go back to the overview effect idea. Uh, again, how can we ourselves put ourselves into a different point of view, but also help a very large population of people who are having trouble you know, shifting their point of view. How, how, how can we help them shift their point of view? I, this is an open-ended meditation. Maybe I should throw this open to some of the folks in the audience. I think, um, yeah, I do you want to say something to, first? Yeah, please. Yeah, and, then, and then anybody would, who'd like to talk, that would be great. Um, no, I would just say, yeah, um, I think I think a big big question is, you know, are, are, is a, is a, is a, is a, hu hu so first of all, I would say that I, I really think that it's important to hold on to the, the hubris and the, the, the sort of like large scale thinking that is found in some of the, you know, even resilience projects or the modern project or the even in acceleration of thinking a little bit, but to take it in other directions. Um, and and I, I believe incredibly strongly in that, particularly because I have seen the rise of so much thinking around the idea of just sort of like living in, in the mess living in the ruins as the, as the modality of life in the Anthropocene. And, and that is what we are already doing. That is what so many people, especially like poor and working class people have been doing for so long already and will just continue to be doing. And I, and I, I personally think that's just like a, a, not an acceptable response to what's happening in the world. And so I think, I, I, I think it's a political um, commitment to, to reassert and re, reappropriate um, hubris and, 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 and you know, big, big thinking and big, big uh, yeah. actions right now. Yeah. I yeah. really believe in that. And and a big question though then for me is, you know, if we think about the South Florida Islands or any other big project, transformative project like that, you know, are these projects that are done to people or are these projects that are waged by people? You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you mm -hmm. know, for themselves, for their future, for their present, or are they, you know, projects waged on them by managers and politicians and planners? Yeah. Um, and again, one of the things that I just, totally adore about Ken Stanley Robinson's books is the um, that these are these are these are projects of a society you know the yeah. projects that you see on Mars you know I, you know I'm very late to reading the Mars books so I'm currently just totally enthralled by them yeah, um, yeah. but you know these are projects waged by people for themselves for their worlds to build their worlds and that the, they are just totally meaningful and totally beautiful and very very challenging and not easy but but totally um, worth doing right so if we think about people, you know, there are people on, on some islands that are saying, we are going to deal with our own, um, you know, future uh, inundated islands. We're gonna manage our own migration rather than having it done to us and being stuffed into the small, you know, uh, uh, climate refugee houses in cities that, that we know nothing about and separated from each other. We're gonna manage our own future and our own response to this. You know, I think increasingly that, that may be something that happens too. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a difference, you know, um, so these are not like a, so if, if this is, if, if the bulldozing of Miami was done to the people, to the, to the residents of Miami, it's, it's a horrifying thing to think. It's just an unthinkable thing to think. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if the people in a place that is, you know, potentially needing massive changes were to take up those questions for themselves, that might be a different question. I don't know. Um, but that difference seems, seems worth marking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if enough people who are, um, aware of the, the problem and the, the likelihood of the near future, people like yourself and maybe people like Gustafson, I don't know them, but um, can map out for the inhabitants clearly enough the inevitability of the collapse of the city that they love, then maybe enough of them will be motivated to take action themselves to radically transform the environment. I mean, I always feel optimistic about people's ability to, to see it. And reality shows that people don't have as much ability to see those kind of horizons as we wish they, as we wish they did, myself included, um, you know. I, I would say, maybe we add to that also though, the, the fact that maybe people do know what's happening and are still don't, uh, you know, see this, these, these, these kinds of proposals or actions as necessary, right? 
I've been, I've really liked the work that I've been reading recently by um, Cassia uh, Paparaki. Mm. She's a geographer and she writes about uh, anticipatory ruination. That's a, that's a oh. term she uses. Wow. Yeah. Um, and she's, she's done a lot of research uh, on climate adaptation in, in, in rural coastal Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, she writes about how this, these, these, you know, labelings of certain areas mm-hmm. as going to be ruined, going to be doomed, you know, due to mm-hmm. climate change, right? yep. is, is part and parcel with projects that in, in, in advance actually ruin the possibility of living in those areas for the people who are staying there. So you have a lot of um, uh, rice farming, uh, you know, in small rural communities in that area and uh-huh. people who want to continue that, that life and see a future there and are fighting for that future. Um, but then you have international financial institutions developed, you know, like World Bank, IMF type, type entities um, that say, oh, this area is doomed because of sea rise. And so they're, they're preemptively based on this kind of portrayal of mm. uh, the, the, the region in that future. They're actually, you know, ruining the, the infrastructures there for the people uh, doing farming by uh, adding salt water so they can set up fish, uh, uh, shrimp, shrimp yep. uh, aquaculture uh-huh. yep. and, and things like that. And as, as a result, um, this is throwing people out of work and ruining their ability to grow rice. And so they're having to move to, to urban, urban centers like Kolkata. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so, uh. so, you know, it's, it's a really useful um, story that she's telling of how, you know, these speculative urban futures of ruin are creations of, yeah. with particular, you know, governmental interests that are, you know, ruining the ability of people who might you know, concretely, materially ruining the ability of people who might otherwise be able to stay and find a way to stay uh, from doing so, right? So that's another possibility, I think, too. Mm-hmm. Super interesting. I posted I posted her name in the link uh, in the chat and Leo found it. Yeah. Yes, Leo, great. I think, Leo, you, you had a couple of, uh, of questions or, or conversation yeah. points you wanted to bring up. Yeah, certainly. Uh, thank you very much. For that, I'm having a lot of like last minute thoughts about destituent power to ruination, but I wanted to um, kind of comment on two points that I found earlier on in a presentation. The first one was this idea of uh, urbanization without the Anthropocene and vice versa, anthropocentric uh, ways of building outside of urbanism. And I'm interested in this because it seems to be in your uh, presentation that there is an overt reliance on uh natural metaphors right you mentioned once that um you know there is a uh you know a rewiring of river systems or some way um you put it uh and and i'm curious because it seems like when climate crisis and collapse it signifies a new era of these pastoral uh, mechanisms or terraforming projects in a sense that makes them like neo-pastoral which could perhaps be uh, a way of kind of moving around um and urbanism without anthropocentrism. And, you know, I was just curious how, uh, you know, how our relationship to the earth and studying an earth as a science perhaps um, could have more of a, uh, you know, a geologic uh, knowledge or awareness uh, in a sense that is outside of, uh, you know, building these uh, giant monuments or skyscrapers that continue to come back in the science fiction imaginary as signs of the wasteland, right? And all in you know, Hollywood blockbusters, it's always the, either the, uh, you know, the Eiffel Tower is a delivery that's submerged. And it seems like there's, uh, you know, a new kind of coordination in your presentation to kind of think about other, you know, irrigation systems, agricultural metaphors that are rewiring or degrowthing or noticing the overgrowth and kind of re, uh, you know, attending to that through other techniques of the year. Uh, yeah, Leo, I think that I maybe met you at the new school uh, when, when I was teaching there. It's nice to see you again. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, yeah, these are, these are interesting questions. I mean, um, you know, there are certainly ways in which living in a place like South Florida or, or other places could be, you know, rewired, let's say, uh, more, more in tune with the environment there. And there are a lot of techniques that, that, that already exist. Uh, that, you know, um, I think, so for example, being off the grid is, is outlawed in Florida, which is really quite crazy, but solar, solar um, power is incredibly uh, viable, it's an incredibly sunny place, you know. Um, rainwater collection is, is a long history of that, especially in like the Key West area. Um, all, you know, uh, they, they shut down a lot of that when they brought on the, the, the full on uh, water, uh, municipal water system. But that's a, certainly a technique that is, that is there's even infrastructure for that's just been kind of covered over. 
um, you know, and all that kind of thing is, is, is quite possible there. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's certainly a place where you feel very much that you're on a planet because you, you look around and you're, you see the, the arc of the ocean in many cases, when you're, when you're on the coast, you see the arc of the sky above you. Um, it's also where, you know, you have just a couple hours north, you have a, where the, the rocket launches take place. So I went and saw a SpaceX launch, um, from there uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting contrast or, or combination because you have this sort of the, the questions of climate change and adaptive response happening in South Florida and just a few hours north, you have these, you know, this other trajectory that is not unrelated of, of leaving earth, right? Uh, the, the SpaceX, uh, NASA, you know, set up over there, um, you know, and I, I think it's, you know, you, I know you talk a lot about this in, in some of the other talks and the projects that you, you guys are working on. And, you know, I think this, it's funny because in some ways when people um, talk about becoming a multi-planetary civilization or Mars colonization and all that kind of thing, um, somehow there's more openness to the ability to imagine just starting something new and making a, a different way of living. Uh, you know, and that's always been part of like sci-fi and, 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 you know, that type of fiction and film, you know, that it's, it seems so closed somehow on earth, you know, it seems so closed in and possibilities, you know, uh, limited, but, you know, you go to another planet and you could, you could start again, and do it again. You know, right? um, and I think that there's something actually, you know, despite everything very compelling about Elon Musk's, uh, you know, when he says the things about, you need to wake up in the morning and think the future is going to be better rather than worse and have that as part of, you know, what drives you and, you know, everything else that could be thought and about him and the project and all that aside. I think that that point is really important because I think so, so many times that is lost from thinking around the Anthropocene that, you know, that it's, it's always, you hear these lines that there is no more happy ending. The future is just going to be worse and worse. And that's a, that's a terrible thing to, to willingly, uh, state, I think. I think that's a terrible thing to will. It's a terrible thing to accept to have happen. Um, and so, you know, I think certainly there are many, many, many ways that that is not the case on Earth <laughs> and that that project is not over on Earth. And it's really worth holding on to. I just had a follow-up. Last time we communicated, you pointed me to Zaha Hadid's uh, Miami project, right? How that was in um, when it, a career class in Parsons. Um, and, and this seems to allude early on, you were mentioning the French, so the French between like a soft architecture and a hard architecture. And, you know, for her work and, you know, parametricism at large attempts to like, you know, uh, inscribe or have in within the blueprint, a, you know, planetary system of, you know, uh, regulating feedback loops, all these, you know, infinite potentials of, uh, you know, automated design. And, uh, you know, I'm wondering if this is perhaps what you allude to here because, you know, very controversial as she is um, and as a lot of these Miami projects are and uh, will be for the rest of uh, this year uh, and many more, you know, I'm wondering, uh, you know, the space of Earth, how to carve it out that is still reliant on the feet beneath our ground and, you know, what makes breathing possible, um, but also, you know, planning for the future. So. Yeah, I mean, you have sort of a multiple imperatives going on of, you know, stopping catastrophic runaway, uh, you know, hothouse earth, you know, and that is a very concrete thing, you know, and stopping everything from becoming roads buckling and getting burns from touching surfaces from heat domes and, you know, stopping what's causing that to happen to the one planet that we have, you know, I mean, it seems like a pretty the pretty obvious first imperative you know, and then on top of it the, the already existing need to reconstruct the uh, uh, you know a, a neoliberal organization of life and you know and, and, and way of living and all these things come together into a massive massive set of questions that are that are very technical you know philosophical apply to everybody not just people in you know politics whatever that would mean you know I mean it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a civilizational moment, I think, that can be, you know, seized or not seized, you know, and, and we have plenty of instances of missed opportunities in, in our history of human life, you know, so there's certainly, and, and nothing really seems to point to, at the moment, uh, it being an opportunity that is not missed, but, what, you know, what we can only see, and 
you know, I in in the case of the, uh, the Zaha Hadid architect's work, uh, you know, I didn't know Zaha, but I have met Patrick Schumacher, who was um, for many years the right hand person, as, as as some people would say, for Zaha. Uh, I remember seeing him first when he was actually a teaching assistant for Zaha back in the '90s at Columbia University, uh, and his energy was extraordinary back then, and it has not abated since then. So losing Zaha, I think, was a, a tremendous loss. Um, I think uh, Patrick is, is carrying on some of the work that her office did underneath her leadership, um, if not most of it. I'm, I, I mean, I can't speculate on that because I don't know them very closely, but I have been at a number of conferences with Patrick, and I think that I'm remembering one that in Rome in 2005, where he presented some of the work that was being done at the AA, um, looking at how airports could become substantially more responsive to the way that people moved through them in terms of security zones, in, in terms of people movers, in terms of the smart technology that would make the entire airport's architecture itself like this swarm around you as you arrived at the airport. And it was a super science fiction-y and very beautiful and high energy uh, vision of what a granularity and parametrization of architecture might be. But there are a lot of other ways to parametrize our world, you know? And so this goes back, in, in, for those of you who aren't part of architectural discourse, it goes back for centuries, of course. Um, and in recent history, it goes back a few decades to questions of animate form and the work of people like Zaha, other architects like Greg Lynn in the 90s when I was a student, um, Sanford Quinter's work, um, the discourse coming out of a sort of a strong formalism, um, a kind of an almost nihilist formalism, I would argue, that's my opinion, in the work of people like Peter Eisenman, um, the arguments for strong formalism that people like Sanford Quinter were making in the 80s and the 90s. And all of this is a kind of a long preamble to say that it's up to us as designers to choose which parameters we actually hook onto and operationalize, you know? And there were some designers who made a pretty conscious decision that it wasn't possible to do a, a simulation at a high, a high enough level to operationalize parameters such that you would make the building more efficient. Therefore, a kind of a, a almost a, a neutral or a nihilist or a weak formalist approach would be to say, let's do the form that we want to do because it feels good or looks good or is cool. And I'm saying that in an extremely, you know, kind of facile way, but that in, in my opinion, that was the argument. Uh, but then we can introduce a strong formalism to it by post-programming it. And indeed some of the novel functions of architecture could be gained in any case, just by post-programming. Um, you know, and I would argue that this is at least part of the subtext in Peter Eisenman's work, part of the subtext in Zaha's work, although she probably would have made an argument for the autonomy of strong formalism as a universe unto itself, which would be separate from whether the building leaked or separate from whether the building was easy to cool or separate from whether the building lasted a decade or two centuries or, you know, 10 centuries. And so this is kind of a subtext that's lying behind questions of formalism and parametric design. Um, of course, I have strong opinions about this. Um, I know people who are genius visionary programmers and strong formalist parametric designers, um, people like Ezio Blazetti and Daniel Willems, you know, who are also caveat are close friends of mine, but I think their work is extremely important. And so the question then becomes, where do you identify the parameters that as an architect you hook onto? Where do you start coding to produce a result? Um, and if you want to, you can go back to um, Christopher Alexander arguments about pattern languages. And you could say, well, there are cross-cultural spatial forms, which if you identify the right ensemble of them, you get a town or a building or a city, which is livable in a way that most people across the past few thousand years have found to be comfortable and livable. And it may be livable also in a, a way that's ecologically connected to its environment. Now, the funny thing I, I think in, um, this is a long answer, sorry, in Christopher Alexander's work that I always felt was a sticking point was there's a kind of a positivist notion that, you know, 
the best common denominator had been found in the formal vocabulary. And that's what made it accessible to computer programmers in the 70s too. And it's what made it accessible as something that hid behind the, the scenes in John Brunner's novel, Shockwave Rider, you know, like as a cultural reference, et cetera, et cetera. And that to me was a little too facile in the sense that I actually don't personally think as a designer that those were the operational aspects that should be or um, could be parameterized. So I would disagree with the Christopher Alexander uh, taxonomy, but I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that general approach. And so this Leo would be a way of, in a long, a long winded way, sorry, of, of responding to that point. I think that it's completely viable to take some of the points, Stephanie, that you're making out of the Gustafsson, you know, South Florida Islands approach and parameterize them, but not parameterize them so they look like a Zaha Hadid project, parameterize them in the sense that they start looking at um, ecosystems, salinity of the ocean, ocean temperatures, um, species that would live better 100 years from now or 70 years from now in a changed environment in terms of temperature, salinity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that those would be parameters that the architect or the landscape designer or the urban designer or the planner would plug into what they're doing in, in, in the kind of bigger picture sense. And maybe some of the results would come out looking like a Zaha Ivy project, but they wouldn't have to. I mean, this is you know an argument I've been making for 20 years in, in architecture. They might as well come out looking like a Mies van der Rohe project, you know, it's just as long as they deal with the heat and ecosystems and energy flow in the way that the parameters demand they deal with it, they don't have to look like a, a living system, a living thing. The building doesn't have to look like a, you know, a wave frozen in time or something like that. You know? So again, sorry for the super long um, interjection here, but I feel like it's very important because the, you know, strong formalism gets a bad rap when you step outside the discipline of architecture because people often look at it and they're like, what the fuck does that building do? It looks incredibly beautiful, but like, yeah, it leaks there and it needs to be cooled like that. And it has a very short lifespan because this part of it is falling up, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And so I think it's very important to make an argument for wise strong formalism uh, and parametrism, parametricism, yeah. I think that's really interesting. And, and a, a related thought, somewhat related to this uh, is, is that one of the things that I have noticed over the last decade as I have been researching urban resilience and what, what it is actually playing out in, what are the forms it's actually playing out through, um, is that, that there has been this incredible rise of infrastructure thinking and infrastructure has become such a dominant uh, lens and, and, and modality through which so much design and so much architecture is, is happening and, and being rethought and in which so many elements of life are also being rethought. So we're seeing um, you know, the rise of critical infrastructure as like the key area to design for urban resilience and not just things like you know, electricity grids or um, you know, a seawall or you know, a 5G network or something like that, but also this, this expansion of the definition of infrastructure to include nature, yep. to include um, animals like oysters, nature like the Everglades, you know, um, forests and things like this, but also people, you know, and human life uh, is being also rethought of as infrastructure. And so you see a lot of different efforts to try to sort of increase the capacities of, you know, communities to respond to disasters and to, to endure them, you know, preparedness uh, networks and, you know, community resilience hubs and things like this are being sort of sponsored um, by, by the planners in you know, these, these design charrettes and these scenario think tanks and city governments and, and this kind of thing, having everybody get their go bags ready and all this kind of stuff. I mean, and, and at a practical level, all these things, you know, technically sure are, make sense, right? But what, what's interesting is that in, in terms of how we think about what design can be, uh, you know, what designing for, you know, climate change looks like, this is a, in some ways, I think a real uh, truncating of the horizon of what, what is possible and doable right now mm -hmm. to redefining kind of all of life in terms of some kind of critical system that ultimately just is a part of maintaining a city as, you know, as it is. So, so, so your ability to, um, as a community or as an individual to not need FEMA or the Red Rock Cross to come and help you during a hurricane 
is seen as a vital component of the city's resilience, right? Because mm. it doesn't overload the emergency response systems, you know, right? It, it, it makes yep. you, you know, it's obviously very neoliberal, but it's also, you know, technically, um, you know, efficient from the viewpoint of the, you know, the city's resilience. And so likewise, the Everglades flowing, you know, oysters living off the coast of New York, right? These are seen as valuable ways of ensuring that the city can endure the stresses and the shocks of, of the, the 21st century. And so these are, this, is a, this is a strange new question for philosophy and for, for design to, to think about what does it mean if, we, if, we, if, if the meaning of life at this moment where it seems clear that we do need to de- redefine what it means to be alive on earth, that what, we've, what, what, what has been a dominant choice is to redefine life as infrastructure that, you know, that, that contributes to the city. Uh, I think that's a, that's worth, you know, thinking about and, you know, questioning to some extent, or at least saying that's not the only definition of life, that, you know, that, that's that the only redefinition that, that is possible right now. And of design. Yes. Yeah. Leo, do you want to, do you want to follow up on that? Um, no, I just, yeah, no, I, I think this is excellent. I just, um, yeah, I'm just curious on where, you know, moments in which the organic and the synthetic or the artificial combine. Uh, and I think a symptom of our contemporary uh, built environments is, uh, you know, subsumed by these conglomerates where, uh, you know, kind of represented in, you know, Stephanie's talk here is where we have these, you know, rebuilding of natural waterways. And to me, this is like, you know, if not like the de- definition of the uncanny, there's not much else, right? The, w- the way in which we are, you know, have so stripped clean uh, the earth's surface and crust and, you know, overgrown the potential of, you know, the earth, which is maybe a uh, uh, definition of the Anthropocene, right? Uh, you know, the way in which we can scale back and kind of regress. I was interested in these like carbon neutral technologies that come from a similar position. It's like we destroyed the earth. Now what's, now what's left is to find a zero point and then start and rewind. So I think these like, you know, through like natural uh, constructs. So I think that's an interesting moment. And I think that's throughout this entire series of the overview effect is ways in which uh, overview, but also uh, overgrowth, which takes a uh, you know, very current moment and uh, you know, attempts to understand it. Yeah, I, I wonder, I tend to wonder how, again, in relationship to helping to understand it, we can position ourselves in relationship to, um, to deep time. You know, I know, Leo, that you thought about this in relationship to things like the Sudbury event, um, which I became aware of in reading what uh, Liz Ellsworth and Jamie Cruz had written about it some years ago. Liz and, and Jamie were the authors of um, some beautiful work and spoke at the design and existential risk um, lectures that I put together back in 2010. And the idea of perceiving geological time simultaneously to human time and their work was so important. Um, You know, it's interesting, Stephanie, because I, I, I wonder again about what it means to help a population to be able to perceive multiple times and whether that's actually a, a good idea or even necessary, because on a, on a certain level, you know, we've all gone through a, an extremely long educational process to get us to the point where we can kind of juggle a number of different time scales and spatial scales. And as designers or as people who observe design, you know, try to understand where interventions would actually accomplish something. Um, but it's a long process to get to the point usually uh, through a fairly elite education where we have the, that vantage point of the overview and it has uncertain results. You know, so I'm not, I'm not being anti-scientific here or anti-education in any, in any sense whatsoever, but I'm just wondering what the most efficient way to galvanize a population might be. Uh, you know, aside from imminent catastrophe, which leads people into panic, um, climate refugees, etc., or war, um, or uh, fanatic behavior, which, mobi- which which can mobilize hundreds of millions of people. But um, I can't think off the top of my head of a moment in history where tens or hundreds of millions of people were mobilized overnight um, in a peaceable way. I mean, certainly there are things like the Kumala Festival or the Pilgrimage to Mecca, et cetera, but 
um, which are peaceable. They have belief systems behind them driving them. So again, I'm, I'm meditating in a kind of an open way, but I'm to, to try to tie it back to Stephanie, to your talk and, and to the theme of the, the lecture series. You're talking about, Stephanie, the, the potential herbicide of not just Miami, but many cities around the planet and the need for the constituents to mobilize towards that as opposed to it being a top-down kind of annihilation of the city by a government or a coalition of investors. Uh, and so it, it's a very interesting political and sentimental challenge, right? Yeah, or maybe the need for people who live in these in, in places to mobilize against it. I mean, that may also be what is, is desirable, right? Oh, sure. may, yeah, yeah maybe it may be many different things. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, one of the, you know, we're in a very anti-elite moment. It's a, at least in the United States, it's a, I am assuming other parts of the world as well. Um, I think the idea that this, this will be a moment where, you know, a, a single expert opinion comes through and, or perspective that comes through and, um, enlightens everyone. It's not, it's not, it's not going to happen that way. And I think it would be more than anything, uh, that, that perspective would be push against, you know, uh, given the, given the sentiment in the, in the, con the country right now on different, different sides of things, right? Um, you know, and I, I, it seems that one of the problems, one of the things that is lacking is that there is not uh, an alternative that is desirable. There isn't something, unless I think it's been a problem for a long time. There isn't a, another project in a, in a big sense. And I don't just mean a, like building a thing, I mean a project, a, 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 a historical world historical project uh, there hasn't been a project that's more desirable that is desirable that, that you can become part of that would make the future look better yeah that would do justice to what is happening that's what to, that would do justice and be an adequate response to what is being done to the earth and to us right now there is there is nothing out there right now like that's you know there are tiny pockets of things that people are trying to do but there's not a major civilizational word historical moment project right there that, that is out there and and what is on offer i think is from a lot of sides one side or the other you know um considered undesirable probably you know and so there's just there's it's a it, it seems there's so much reaction and resentment yeah. and 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 hatred and 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 darkness you know as a result and until something can break through that and be a not a regressive yeah it's a symptom of the end of history probably yeah, right yeah, 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 and, yeah and how do you break through that end of history how do you restart history because history never ended uh you know yeah. it, it, and i think that any discourse that says that we should just dwell in this and just you know just that we should reduce our life to survive in some ways is part of that because i think it is so important to break through this impasse to be to to reappropriate human agency mm -hmm. in a positive mm -hmm. powerful sense at this time, yeah. probably more than any other time. How could we look back as humans in 200 years and think that we just, that, that was all we did, that was all we did. <laughs> um, that's, that's but, the, yeah. but there's, there doesn't seem to be something, you know, I think in some ways, again, that's the Kim Stanley Robinson, um, beautiful thing. They're, they're, they're in, you know, on Mars, it's very contested, the different interpretations of what should be done, but there is a, historical project that you can join and that's that's that's, that's intended to be liberatory not regressive you yeah. know yeah. yeah yeah getting yeah of course the, there's also the dithering he maps out in 2312 from the future historian's perspective where we go on for decades and decades and decades knowing exactly what we know what you've talked about today what peter talked about the other day and um we don't collectively act coherently towards it. So it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I found it very compelling that in 2312, uh, Warham and Swan and the group of people who had worked with, uh, with that team made the decision to reseed Earth with the full diversity of genetic packages that had been conserved in the terrarium off planet, in the terraria off planet. And also the potentially you know, one, one assumes the novel ones that had emerged in the um, hybridized uh, biomes terraria uh, 
and it had to be a, a kind of a risky but planetary scale decision to bring that diversity back to Earth. So, yeah, it's the balance. I, I hear all of the criticisms that you're bringing up about the, the Elon Musk projects, but also I, I hear pretty loud and clear the um, celebration of that level of energy and initiative and drive, you know? So, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. How to maintain that energy, how to build it. A return of natural history, Leo says. The end of history or a return of natural history. Yeah, well. And I think there's so much that is said against the human now in under the, the auspices of the Anthropocene, against human the human, you know, tropes of sort of anti-humanism that are kind of re-emerging uh, as as there's this sort of discovery of nature again, right? You know, mm -hmm. sort of um, you know, this idea that the that the earth is earth forces are so much more powerful than human forces, uh, you know, and, and that, that we should humble human being. And this is a this is a reaction I see a lot it, in in writing about the Anthropocene and what it means to be human. And and I just think that that doesn't it, it's not adequate to the situation. And yep. you know, I think that um, especially especially again, given given the the absolute disempowerment of the majority of people on earth that, that building the Anthropocene has required. You know the, the proletarianizing of people, the stripping of people of their relationship to skills, each other, land, capacities, power over their own life, power over their future. You know, given that this so this this project of disempowering people, governance and control, this this project has been fundamental to building the Anthropocene. It's not just you know coal plants. You know, it's not just um, cities. It's it's this process too. You know, and it cannot be understood without that process. Given that, the idea that we would champion uh, a humbling of the human, you know, writ large, just doesn't make any sense to me. It's, it's got to be a time of, of reclaiming that. And you know, I think there's some there's some interesting some writing. You know, Nigel Clark, the geographer, and some other people who who write a lot about the, you know, the the, the power of Earth forces and the asymmetry between you know, human capacities and these, these forces like, you know, volcanoes and, mm -hmm. you know, so on and hurricanes. You know, I, I, one of the things I love about Nigel's writing is that he doesn't focus on that asymmetry uh, in order to then downplay human capacity. What he actually writes about just repeatedly, and this is not necessarily what you usually kind of hear interpreted from his writing, but this is at least yeah. how I take it, yeah. uh, is, is that what you actually get are these endless stories of like human capacity to wield those powerful earth forces and elements to yep. tame them to to fight them to also survive them but more than that too to live with them to you know create in them to make art with them to, to you mm -hmm. know all these incredible things to fight with them you know and 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 to push back against them too you know and yeah. and, and i think that that's that's a far more beautiful and 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 powerful way to think about, you know, living on a on a, a volatile, uh, you know, extremely powerful world of more than human forces, rather than sort of disappearing into the the blizzard of it all. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm also remembering the image that you showed of people doing backflips right at the edge of a uh, giant waterfall, you know, and. On the one hand, it's it's kind of like the argument that people who solo rock climbs make, you know, and the argument that I used to make myself when I when I was much younger with solo rock climbs. Well, when you drive a car 65 miles an hour down the road, every single second you're in control of your life and other people's lives. If you take your hand off the wheel, you die. Rock climbing is no different than that. You know how to rock climb. And there are objective hazards like animals in the cliffs and things that could fall off and weather can change, et cetera. But the same thing can happen when you're driving on the highway. So there's a kind of a rationalization of what the risks might be in relationship to some generally accepted presumed notion of risk, which everybody accepts when they get onto the highway. Um, but I think it's important to also place it in the context that you're placing it with the images that I've seen you talk about of the people doing backflips right on the edge of the waterfall, you know. Um, placing yourself consciously 
in the edge in a position of risk could imply either oblivious, obliviousness to the risk or you know, foolishness, or it could imply total awareness of what the risk is um, and an interest in simply existing at that place. Or it could imply that you had no choice. You had to go to the edge. You were told to go to the edge where someone put you on the edge and you had to do some backflips to get away, etc. cetera. Um, and it also makes me think about scale shifts because the planet has nearly lost all of its life a number of times in the past few hundred million years. Uh, and presumably we might have dodged a bullet, you know, just two centuries ago, who knows, maybe a planet killing asteroid zipped on by before we were a space aware civilization and missed us by a few hundred miles. And um, so in that sense, being aware that when we entered into the Anthropocene, we simply uh, adopted a position which natural systems had held for hundreds of millions, billions of years, um, doesn't necessarily set us apart from nature. It isn't the, um, ex it isn't exactly a return to natural history and it isn't the kind of Agamben-esque um, riffing on the end of history. It's something else. It's positioning us in a, in, a, in a somewhat different place. Again, for me, Stephanie, what this always loops back to is the question of whether an individual or a group of individuals or a total population uh, can have some kind of discourse about these questions because this, this is a, a, an extremely elite and um, sandboxed conversation. And a big part of me hopes that it, it, it doesn't stay that way, that it percolates out and, you know, in the fantastic optimisms and, and tactical operations that you're talking about um, to hundreds of millions of people. But then I wonder how it can. And then I return to yesterday's talk by Peter Watson, I think pessimistically about the limits of human um, cognitive ability, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a constant back and forth for me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it it is and it isn't an elite conversation, right? You know, there's a, there's a version of this that's an elite conversation that goes on amongst theorists and you know artists and academics, and, and it circulates in conferences and and you know biennales and, mm -hmm. and whatever yeah. symposiums, yeah. right? Um, and there's certain languages and 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 debates that are happening. Maybe some of those debates are absolutely just pointless and meaningless and not even interesting to a whole other set of people who are not in those environments, but that for whom they, these, these are some of the questions of the Anthropocene, some of these concrete questions that we're asking, even the questions about being at this civilizational, um, you know, breaking point uh, and, and what does it mean to become human and, and, and totally re rethink how we, we live and define what life can be. I think these are questions that tons of ordinary people are having like all over the place because and I, and I would say that only on the basis of my own experience, which although I'm, 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 f I'm fortunate to be a part of conversations like this that we're having and, and academic ones, I also spend um, you know, a great deal of my time not in those environments. You know? um, I spend a, a, a lot of my time with my friends who are not involved in any of these, 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 these contexts or conversations who are you know, working as doormen in a big, nice building or, you know, trying to keep a you know gym coaching career somehow yep. afloat you know this yep. sort of thing yep. and yep. Yep. and also teaching you know and I and these are questions I this is what I teach about too and for the most part I have worked with students who are you know sort of working class or, or sort of you know low income context uh, for the most part not only but um and these these kinds of questions are already on on people's minds too the, you know in, in these other environments Maybe they're they're taking different routes, you know, and they're yeah. they're taking different co colors and tenors, and you know, I mean, the one thing that, that certainly comes up a lot is that people just really want to learn how to do things, you know, and that comes up so so often, so frequently, when you think about the challenges that you face, when people think about the challenges that they face, when students, when you know, you know, people talk talk about these questions, but not just in a context of survival, and not just in a context of. Um, getting by, but also in a context of, of this, of, of, of being able to do things, of learning skills, of learning things that are, you know, often sort of like, you know, in a caricature preceded, like what people always knew how to do, you know, whatever. Right. Um, these are seen as, you know, part of getting, you know, 
re-empowering oneself or getting getting liberated from being sort of a hostage to this sort of uh, you know in, in, infrastructural society where you you go to work and go home and you eat from a plastic tub from a grocery store you know I mean mm -hmm. there's a huge huge desire widespread desire um, to to be able to be a part of one's own existence to to get get one's hands on the means of existence. And sometimes that takes the form of like learning survival skills and, and things that might be categorized as being a, a resilient infrastructure human, mm -hmm. you know, but but also yeah. not, right? And and I think a lot of times, you know, some of the taking up of these skills, you know, learning them, trying to, to, to be more involved in the makeup of one's own life, you know, these are these are basic uh, parts of a becoming a human subject, you know, being being able to wield some of these skills. Be able to to be adapted to an environment, being able to, you know, control an environment that one lives in, or or respond to it, or know how to, you know, build something in it, or engage it, or fight a fire in it. You know, I, I remember one of my my the, an amazing student I had um, who was thinking about these questions ended up going back home to California and fighting, learning how to fight wildfires. You know, and I need to know, write. So, I need to write him. What what was I, we, I guess Galen. we shouldn't mention yet yeah, Galen. Yeah. I, yeah. He wrote to me last year and during the pandemic and I didn't write back to him. He was, I, I had a wonderful class with him as well. We, we probably shouldn't talk about full names because we're doing this public event, but no, I, I know exactly who you're talking about. And I was so impressed with what they did. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah I would just say that it was very, very, very uh, thoughtful and deep taking up of some of the questions of the Anthropocene. And, yes. and I think we're seeing this all over the place. Um, people, you know, it's, it's leading to material uh, transformations and, and learning the techniques and things like that. And in that, in that moment, in that learning, in that um, wielding of, 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 of techniques and skills, there is so much more going on than just becoming a resilient infrastructure. I think that it's also points up, you know, a, a different trajectory of, of people who, you know, yeah. really become agents in, in their environments and in their lives rather than being subject to those things. Yes, exactly. And, and, and this is a really important moment. And if this is happening on a wide scale, along with some of these other things that we're talking about, this rethinking of, you know, how we are living, this, you know, these, these kinds of questions that are being asked, it's not, it's not insignificant um, at all. I think at a, at a, at a level in, of, you know, in terms of thinking about what it means to be human and then what we are becoming as humans. That makes me hopeful. <laughs> yeah. That makes me hopeful. Does anyone else want to chime in? We're close to the end of our time. We're, we're pretty much at the end of our time, but we could take one more question if anyone has. Or if not, we could say thank you to Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, Leo thank says you, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. It was Amazing. nice talking with you. Amazing talk. I look forward so much to the next time. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Weston. Cool, so um, we'll be in touch, but we're gonna have more events across the summer and the fall uh, as part of this uh, ongoing series with the, with the Biennale and uh, hopefully do a big shindig in November on Cosmopolitics. So I, I hope, Stephanie, you can join us for that again later on in the year, yeah. Totally, I look forward to it. Cool. I, uh, good luck with everything. Cool, thanks so much. All right, everybody, take care. Thank you for joining us today.